Hello and welcome to the Doof Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Matt Geomest Denver. And I'm Scott Badass Dallas. Scott, you, you can't just... Badass is not a use cast. I mean, just just the fact that uh, that you think that shows exactly why you will never be a member of that use cast, Matt. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the book club. I hope you're all having a wonderful Friday night. Uh, I'm sure we know a lot of you guys, but if you are here for the first time, welcome to the Doof Media Book Club. Um, we are, if you've never listened to any of our stuff, this is the first time you've stumbled upon us. We are uh, a, a media company that makes podcasts and talks about all the stories we love. We also arrange and organize this monthly book club. Uh, Matt, why don't you explain that thing? And if you're here in the chat, uh, why don't you go ahead and say hello? Yeah. Well, so while people are introducing themselves, uh, each month, Scott and I select five books from, from a pool submitted to us by our wonderful Doof community. We put up a poll for all of our supporters on Patreon, patreon.com slash doofmedia, and let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it. All right. Uh, we, then we meet up the last Friday of every single month, and we chat about the book that was chosen. This is not the, This is the first Friday of the new month. It counts. It's February's yeah. weird. Um, we pull slides of important or interesting moments that, and then dive deep into this book for a couple of hours. For those of you in the chat right now, like we said, feel free to make comments, um, ask questions. Just let, let us know what you think about what we're talking about. We go through. We want this thing to be an interactive discussion. This is a book club. It's not just Matt and I talking while you guys listen, hopefully. Um, so to go ahead and do that. And uh, Matt, what uh, what book are we doing this month? Well, this month's book was the Hugo Award winning The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemison. And the summary of this book uh, reads as follows from Goodreads. This is the way the world ends. Again, three terrible things happen in a single day. As soon, a woman living an ordinary life in a small town comes home to find that her husband has brutally murdered their son and kidnapped their daughter. Meanwhile, Mighty Sanze the world-spanning empire whose innovations have been civilization's bedrock for a thousand years, collapses as most of its citizens are murdered to serve a madman's vengeance. And worst of all, across the heart of the vast continent known as the Stillness, Great Red Rift has been torn into the heart of the earth, spewing ash enough to darken the sky for years or centuries. Now Isun must pursue the wreckage of her family through a deadly dying land, Without sunlight, whose innovation water and arable land, and with limited stockpiles of supplies, there will be war all across the stillness, a battle royale of nations not for power or territory, but simply for the basic resources necessary to get through the long dark night. Asun does not care if the world falls apart around her. She'll break it herself, if she must, to save her daughter. All right, so that is um, an interesting ex uh, summary there. Uh huh. Rather uh, incomplete, I would say. Yeah, I mean, and I thought the the empire Sanze had already fallen before the events of the book. It's like the remnants of them, right? I, I don't know. That's what yeah. I thought. But yeah, uh, it's just, it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. they they got to do what they got to do. Um, I see Brandon's Brandon's in the chat. Zach's in the chat. Um, they're talking about how much they like the book. So let's do that, Matt. What was your overall impression of the book? And while Matt is going through his explanation, why don't you guys in the chat tell us uh, what you thought of it? Had you read it before um, and what your overall thoughts were? And Matt, you go first. Yeah. Well, so I, as usual, I did the audiobook, So I will be the touchstone for pronunciations. <laughs> um, and and I, I enjoyed this book. The, I, I, there are a few things about it where I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what they meant even after thinking about it for a while. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm really happy that we're doing this book club because it's always, I'll, we always figure things out when we're talking about the books. That's, that is true. And there's certain things like uh, the choice to make the three point of view characters. Um, I suppose it goes without saying, this is a full spoilers discussion. Yeah. The, the three point of view characters <laughs> actually are the same person. And this is held, this is, this is withheld from you for a long time. Um, that's one thing where I'm just not, I'm not sure exactly why it was done. Um, and then there's the second person thing that I'm sure we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. so, so like, there's a lot of things in my mind where I'm like fixated on them and I want to figure them out. But, but just in a global sense, I enjoyed the book. I, I, I liked a lot of the character stuff. Um, it was the, the setting is probably the thing that stands out the most. I think that 
anyone who walks away from this book is going to be thinking about the setting and, and, and the world building that went into this this universe um, and the creativity of like a magic system built entirely on like geology powers and yeah and all of that. So that, that I certainly enjoyed that because my background is largely in you know geology. So right, um, right. yeah, um, and Zach. Zachary is saying in the chat that uh, they like the sense of being dropped into a world where they had no idea what was going on. Um, Brandon is saying they hadn't read it before. They also read the audiobook like you, Matt, and they liked it very much. <laughs> and they felt so dumb when the girl chose her name because I think that's the first moment of realization that they are the same person. Um, people are agreeing they like being confused, and that's definitely what this book does. One of the things I, I'm going to talk about as we go through this thing is this idea of sometimes I think books are like made to be read a second time Mm -hmm. and like there's stuff there's moments in this book that pay off so much more after you read it the first time and i think we're going to be getting to one almost right away um and i i I think that's fascinating i really really enjoyed this book i think the the funny thing is i was introduced to nk jemison um from a podcast i think it was the ezra klein podcast yeah and he basically had her on there to talk about the concept of world building and like as, as part of that hour long podcast, like I think at the end of it, after she laid out her concepts of world building, they like made a world and like made a society and like fleshed it all out like in 30 minutes. And it was really cool. And uh, and so like, I guess I had in my head that like this lady knows what she's doing when it comes to world building. So maybe maybe I kind of had an attitude going in that it was like, OK, prove it. Yeah. Um, right, impress me. Yeah. Right. And and it did. I, I think this world is fascinating. I really, really like it. And we're really only scratching the surface of it, I think, because <laughs> get it? It's a uh, it's a yeah, it's a geology yeah. joke. Um, I think there's there's two more books in the series, and I think they're going to really explore everything that's going on here. But we just get to see a little bit of it, and that little bit is enough to really really interest me. Um, one of the things I realized as I was pulling slides to get ready for this thing is I pulled a lot more from the beginning of the book than I did at the end, and I think that's just because I loved the setup so much. And if I had a complaint about this book, it's that the end of it didn't really like didn't really do a lot for me. Um, I think the reveal that that Alabaster is the one that breaks the world um, was cool. But I kind of guessed that by by that point already. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, we'll have we'll talk about that as we get to it. But that's that's just something I noticed. I was much more interested in the, the setup than I was the payoff. And maybe it's because this is not really a payoff. It's just the whole thing is set up for books two and three Mm -hmm. yeah i'll definitely say that the you know the 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 science was all like really impressive and and, you know correct as as far as i could tell you know except for the fact that you can you know transfer energy between things with your mind yeah yeah Yeah. it was cool like i mean you're you you know this stuff um (laughs) i i took two geology classes in college so i am not an expert of of geology by any means but um I, I, I took enough geology to like be interested in, in how all this stuff works and the end, the concept around, okay, let's talk about geology. Let's talk about plate tectonics. Let's talk about um, what happens when the earth moves and let's build an entire culture and world and magic system around that. It's a really inventive, mm-hmm. cool idea. Even, I feel like even just the idea of a, a ridiculously tectonically active planet yeah. um, is, a, is an intrinsically interesting fictional premise, e- even without the idea of the erogenies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that uh, obviously we'll get into all these things. So yeah. should so, we just get into it? Yeah, let's just, before we go, uh, Metathulu says that they're a sucker for the second person aspect of the book and the tone of the prologue instantly hooked them. Um that's a perfect way to transition to those things because that's I think that's our first few slides dealing with that stuff. All right. So, yeah, these are the opening words of the book. Let's start with the end of the world, why don't we? Get it over with and move on to more interesting things. First, the personal ending. There is a thing she will think over and over in the days to come as she imagines how her son died and tries to make sense of something so innately sense- senseless. She will cover Uche's broken little body with a blanket except his face because he is afraid of the dark and she will sit beside it outside. The world has already ended within her and neither ending is for the first time. She's old hat at this by now. What she thinks then and thereafter is, but he was free. And it is her bitter weary self that answers this almost question. Every time her bewildered shocked self manages to produce it. He wasn't not really, but now he will be. 
but you need context. Let's try the ending again, writ continentally. Here is a land. It is ordinary as lands go, mountains and plateaus and canyons and river deltas, the usual. Ordinary except for its size and its dynamism. It moves a lot, this land. Like an old man lying restlessly abed, it heaves and sighs, puckers and farts, yawns and swallows. Naturally, this land's people have named it the stillness. It is a land of quiet and bitter irony. The stillness has other names. It was once several other lands. It, it's one vast, unbroken continent at present. But at some point in the future, it will be more than one again. Very soon now, actually. So here's our, our part of our prologue. Um, and I, I really love this, Matt. I, this got me like into the book right away, I think. Because what, one of the things I think this book is doing generally is it's kind of taking a lot of the very traditional fantasy story tropes and turning them on their head a little bit and i think one of the ways it does that is let's start with the end basically it's let's start with the end and get that out of the way because that's not the important part yeah um and then of course the other element which i think is going to pop out at us and hit us in the head over and over again is is that like this reads very differently on a reread actually yeah, this is the first time you know you, you put these slides together this is the first time i'm really looking at this again and, you know, this this line, you know, th this thing that she thinks after her son is dead is, but he was free. And that harkens back to basically her motivation for why she killed her first son. Yeah. Um, which is something that she never really thinks about consciously when she is, um, um, man, I get all their names. As soon. As soon. Yeah. yeah. I assume never really thinks about that explicitly. Right. Which is, I mean, like part of this book is, is a clever, just giving you enough information without giving you too much to guess that they're all the same person until the book wants you to. Yeah. Um, but it also, I think does a really good job of establishing that within the world. Like there's a very good reason why Asun is not thinking about her lives before this one, mm -hmm. um, because she's specifically decided to move on from them and, and not focus on that kind of thing and not think like she's actively avoiding doing that. And I think that's a great way of like using your necessary book trickery to pay off a moment um, without really breaking your character or yeah, breaking sure. the world. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really like in this, this slide in particular though, is like we start off and the book immediately focuses on the personal, right? Like it's a first, a personal ending. It dives into the instigating event for our character. And then after that, it backs out and says, okay, you need context after that. And I think what that's, this is doing is showing the two things, um, the two things the the book is going to focus on, which is first the characters and then second the world building. And it establishes both of these things are the most important parts to what the book wants to talk about and establishes kind of like a priority order of them. First, we're going to talk about the personal, then we're going to fill in the rest around that. Um, and that just so happens to be the way I like stories told. So maybe that's why I like this book so much. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I love I love the idea of I love that they named it the stillness. I love the quiet and bitter irony of that. That's a, a beautiful turn of phrase, such as also how the the, the, the land is described as an old man puckering and farting <laughs> lying yeah. on its side. Like, I love that. That's like there's a lot of very in inventive turns of phrase in this story. And it's like this is a very like none of this prose is purple. It's it's a very casual type of storytelling, right? Especially yeah. in the second person. Like, let's start with the end of the world. Why don't we? Like, it's very informal. It's very casual. Um, and we kind of find out, like, we will eventually find out who this person is that's talking to us, who the person that's talking in second person is by the end of the story. Um, but I, I just, I, I like that style a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's funny. I forgot until you mentioned that, that we do find out who the narrator is. Yeah. Um, I just, like, that, that, that reveal was such a, it's it so, so came out of nowhere to me that I was like, oh, I don't know what to do with that information. <laughs> yeah, um, and I agree with that because I don't know what to do with that character. That's the, yeah. the thing. Yeah, uh, Brendan and Zachary in the chat are discussing how horrifying the stillness is, be a horrible <laughs> place to live. Yeah, um, yeah. And Zachary says it almost justifies their horrifying lifestyle. Yeah, I mean that's that's one thing that that basically they're they're a civilization where it's it's just understood. That if there's ever like a super volcanic eruption or, or whatever, then like a lot like like most of the people in towns are just going to be like turned out into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Just like just like, yeah, we don't have room for you. You know, yeah. just to deal with it. I mean, the entire society is is built around the fact that 
uh, the world's probably going to end for a few years every once in a while, and we have to yeah. be constantly ready for it. And like no construction beyond a certain level can be built except in specific places. It's just so like it, it, it really is to me. Take the concept of a world with crazy tectonic activity and then see how human beings would respond to that. That, that mm-hmm. seems like that's how Jemison approached approach to the, the world building there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then introduce people with, with superpowers in it and see how culture wraps itself around to those people. Yeah. All right. So um, this next slide is a little bit later in the prologue, but I wanted to read this part because this is one of the things that I think also, like you were talking about, Matt, plays so much better on a second read than it does on a first one. What will you do? He asked her. When it's done. Will your kind rise up through the rubble and take the world in our stead? No, she says. Why not? Few of us are interested in that. Anyway, you'll still be here. The man understands that she means you in the plural, your kind, humanity. She often treats him as though he represents the whole species. He does the same to her. You sound very certain. She says nothing to this. Stone eaters rarely bother stating the obvious. He's glad, because her speech annoys him in any case. It does not shiver the air the way a human voice would. He doesn't know how that works. He doesn't care how that works. But he wants her silent now. He wants everything silent. End, he says. Please. And then he reaches f- forthwith. <laughs> That's a typo. Forthwith. Forthwith, with, a, with all the fine control that the world has brainwashed and backstabbed and brutalized out of him, and all the sensitivity that his masters have bred into him through generations of rape and coercion and highly unnatural selection, his fingers spread and twitch as he feels several reverberating points on the map of his awareness, his fellow slaves. He cannot free them, not in the practical sense. He's tried before and failed. He can, however, make their suffering serve a cause greater than one city's hubris and one empire's fear. So he reaches deep and takes hold of the humming, tapping, bustling, reverberating, rippling vastness of the city and the quieter bedrock beneath that. Then he reaches wide, taking hold of the great sliding puzzle piece of earth shell on which the continent sits. Lastly, he reaches up for power. He takes all that, the strata and the magma and the people and the power in his imaginary hands. Everything. He holds it. He is not alone. The earth is with him. Then he breaks it. So this is the end of the world. Um, we learn a little bit later that this is Alabaster, our main uh, male character in the story, I guess. Yeah. Um, and like, this is the thing, like, this was impactful to me the first time I read it. But when I pulled the slide for our preparation and reread it, this means so much more to me now. Like right. the, the the emotion of this, the emotion of the words like mean so much more when you understand them. And like, I, I get, I get the, the, the idea behind putting this in the very beginning. And like, I think it creates a sense of mystery and confusion. You want to understand this. What is this? What is this brainwashed and backstab and brutalized people? Who are these people? What happened to them? Why, why is this guy so desperate for the end? But on a reread, this is beautiful. It, it like, it elevates it for me because I understand him. I understand his pain. I understand why he feels this way. Like when he says end, like the please, it is, it is beautiful and heartbreaking. Um, and I wonder, like, I wonder not, not to like disparage the writing and say this is bad writing, but like sometimes you wonder if things are made are written to be read more than once, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I felt the same. In fact, this is the one part of the book that I went back to, and, and listen to again before I even finished because I, I sort of figured out that it was alabaster and I was like, yeah, what uh, I was like, okay, well, I need to read that again and figure out the context because, okay, he's got his stone eater friend here. Um, the, the idea is they're intentionally going to destroy the world. You know, you see all these details, like he reaches out and we know that he can basically take control of other orogenies. Yeah. And we know that he can, that he can use the power of the, of the floating obelisks. So that's yeah. why he's reaching up, you know? So it's, it's all like all, all the puzzle pieces are in here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it enables him to do what he does and, and then it all, you know, it makes sense. And you know why he does this by the end. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not entirely why, because 
I think he has a plan beyond just kill everyone. Yeah, he does. It's not but, it's not just like that's what I think was so funny about the summary. The summary is like he's doing it for revenge. Right. And I was like, I think a it's a man. little I think it's a little more than that. Yeah. I think that's that's what that's what the society would want to construct him as is the man doing it just for revenge. Yeah, it's a little bit weird that the summary says like, oh, yeah, the madman, because it's like, yeah, um, he, uh, that's <laughs> that's what the bad guys would call him. Right, right. Maybe the maybe the summary was written by the bad guys. Maybe, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like to be fair, he does murder millions of people. True, true, true. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think we're we're seeing in the chat here that people are agreeing with the the uh, five six seven is is agreeing that they listen to this at the end of uh, right um, as soon as they finish the book as well. Um, and then yeah, people are agreeing that this is a really impactful on a second read. That's why I I, I don't know, man. Like just like. I don't think a book should make you should make you need to read it more than once to appreciate it fully, but it's amazing yeah. how much it does. Br- Brennan points out that Cyanite calls him a madman when she works under him. <laughs> but but the thing is, like, what does he do in the story other than this that qualifies him as being like like he's he's been broken by his by his experiences and the abuses that he's gone through and the and the loss that he's suffered. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's fair to call him a madman you know setting this setting this event aside which we don't really know why he does this <laughs> yeah um setting the whole ending the world thing aside yeah, yeah i mean but that's i kind of love this one thing i really enjoy about this book is like we're seeing this all through her eyes um and and she for the longest time just doesn't understand him on a fundamental level so like she's making conclusions and we have to kind of guess at what is going on in his head while she's like getting through her um, preconceived dislike for him. Um, and, and we actually see like, it's, it's, it's such a, such kind of a, a power flip thing. And the book kind of directly addresses this later, but this idea that like, he's the most powerful of these guys that have ever lived. And yet he, she is like fundamentally stronger than him um, in spirit and heart, just because he's been broken and torn apart, like mentally throughout his life. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think that's a really cool way of of broaching this character. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting way of talking about these these ideas of of how there are different kinds of strength. Certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on. It's been like twenty minutes. Let's let's move on to the actual story. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Um, So on this slide, uh, we introduce Asun to the method that her portion of the story will be told in. You are she. She is you. You are Asun, remember? The woman whose son is dead. You are an orogeny who's been living in the little nothing town of Terimo for ten years. Only three people here know what you are, and two of them you gave birth to. Well, one left, who knows, now. For the past ten years, you've lived as ordinary a life as possible. You came to Terimo from elsewhere. The townsfolk don't really care where or why. Since you were obviously well-educated, you became a teacher at the local creche for children, age 10 to 13. You're neither the best teacher nor the worst. The children forget you when they move on, but they learn. The butcher probably knows your name because she likes to flirt with you. The the baker doesn't because you're quiet and because like everyone else in town, he thinks you're, he he thinks he just thinks of you as Jija's wife. Jija is a Terimo man born and bred, a stone napper of the resistant use cast cast. Everyone knows and likes him and they like you peripherally. He's the foreground of the painting that is your life together. You are the background. You like it that way. You are the mother of two children, but now one is dead and the other is missing. Maybe she's dead too. You discover all of this when you come home from work one day. House empty, too quiet, tiny little boy all bloody and bruised on the den floor. And you shut down. You don't mean to. It's just a bit much, isn't it? Too much. You've been through a lot. You're very strong, but there are limits to what even you can bear. So this is our introduction proper of kind of this this second person point of view. And I kind of wanted to use this slide as a way of us to bridge the topic of because I think this is one of the most controversial decisions in this book is to tell at least a third of the story from second person. Um, and I want to know what you think of it, Matt. I, I, I like it. Uh, I just don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's yeah, that's the thing, right? Like I, I like second person in general. It's something that I've played with as a way of telling a story. Like normally, it, it makes the most sense when it's a story that's being, um, 
that's being told like by a narrator. Right. Um, and this story sort of does, sort of has a narrator, and since it makes sense, I mean, we'll, we'll just say it. The, the narrator is, you know, the 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 stone eater boy mm-hmm. that she finds. So she meets him when she is is older, when she's a soon. So it makes sense that if he's telling the story, he's telling it in the like in the in the in a different way than the other two, yeah. because the other two are are the past. Like, like, I think it's fair to say this is the present, the other two yeah. are the past, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. What do you think about it? I like it. Um, I, I wonder, like, this is not a point of view that's used very often, especially in Western literature. And I, part of me wonders, is it not used very often because, like, people don't like it? Or do people not like it because it's not used very often? You know, like, mm-hmm. is the reason why this turn? Because we had some people on our Discord, and I've read other places where people said, they couldn't keep going with the book because it bothered them too much. And I'm wondering, is it is it just like a thing that naturally doesn't work as well with us or is it not work as well because we're just not used to it being used? Um, I kind of think it's probably the latter because I think what happened to me in the story is I kind of just got used to it by the end of the book and I stopped like noticing it as much. Um, yeah. as, as for like, there's an inherent contradiction with the second person stuff, which is like you're telling someone stuff that they've done, right? So it's like, you have to make a reason for why the person would not understand, like would need to be retold why they did something. Yeah, that that's true. I but mean, I, but I think the book does that. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I got, I, I got used to it almost immediately because in, in the audio book, like your brain isn't really stumbling over it. You're just processing somebody's speech, which is much easier. Um, yeah. Yeah. It just, it just made a lot of sense. And it is interesting. Cause I looked up, I was very curious. I was like, all right, all right. N.K. Jemison, what'd you do this for? What's your reasoning behind it? And you look it up and you you expect like this really long, complicated, involved answer. And in her mind, it was just, I was just experimenting with uh, points of view and I did it and I liked it. So I kept doing it. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Okay. Well, this well, is one of those death fine. of the author things where now we get to figure out why she really did it. Right. Well, I mean, and and I think there there is, a, there is something like there is something to the idea that as soon is like broken and searching for herself and searching for identity and like part of the journey of the story is like we're learning about demaya we're learning about um is it cyanite is cyanite, <laughs> cyanite. Yeah. um yeah. We're, we're learning about these two characters and we're learning about like w- these characters are like kind of being reabsorbed into the person who as soon is um and and so i think from that perspective like someone narrating your life to you um, makes sense within this journey to to rediscover who you are, right? Yeah, I mean, especially with the way this begins, where she's just like shattered and catatonic right. for several days, and and kind of kind of loses the ability to think coherently. Yeah, um, she kind of needs to be rebuilt from from all the strength that is within her. Like, I mean, it, this is one of those things where on a reread, it is really um, kind of I think more impactful actually because yeah. it's like it's talking about like you know you know, you, you've been through a lot, you're very strong, but there are limits to what even you can bear. Like she's, she's been through some, some pretty terrible things, Yeah. but she, the, coming home to this after like a life of relative stability and thinking that she's kind of left all that behind her is just, just broken her. Yeah. It's, so, it, I love that line. It's just a bit much, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I love that. Yeah. The, the voice actor was great in this because it's like this. Uh, I don't know. I can't really replicate it. But it, well, it and I wonder if part of the, the way second person works here is you can have that kind of like that's a little cheeky in, yeah. in discussing a woman who is like suffering from one of the worst things imaginable, the death of her son. And yeah. I think like you couldn't do that in a first person perspective, even a third person perspective. I don't know if that would work as well, but because like you're you're telling the story to the person, I think that cheekiness kind of works you know yeah i'm yeah. not sure if i'm explaining that right but well I, I mean i like the word cheeky because i can't think of a better word honestly <laughs> um but like what i want to say about this slide is like this it may it may be my least favorite thing about the book is that it begins with this horrible thing happening to a character that we haven't really met yet yeah and that's risky storytelling wise because oh, yeah you like usually storytelling you want to make me like the character before you start hurting them this is like the first thing we know about as soon as her son is murdered right there in front of her and yeah. i don't i don't know who she is i don't care about her 
I, I don't know whether I should like her or not. I feel like a kind of like pity for her because this thing has happened. But I don't know. First of all, I don't know if pity is the first emotion you want to evoke here. But, but, but maybe <laughs> it is. Yeah. Maybe that's exactly what Jemison wants to do. Is, yeah. And, and then and then there's the element, like you said, of like almost a kind of uh, intentional distancing and t- turning down the volume on the pain of this by putting in like putting in the second person and putting in some, some uh, deeper some some impersonal kind of language yeah well i mean like even if you look at that one at the very top like um only three people here know what you are and two of them you you gave birth to and then that well one left who knows now that's like so like like cold it is it's really cold and i I don't know if if you're if you're in a third person omniscient or if you're in a first person you kind of maybe look at at assume differently if she's the one thinking that right like yeah. if, if that's coming from her brain, maybe that that changes how you feel about her. And not that like, I mean, sometimes when you've suffered a terrible thing, stuff like that just pops into your head and it's like the cruel irony of that kind of thing. Um, but I just think I just think it's so much more effective from the point of view of someone relaying this to the person who experienced it. Mm-hmm. See, the, the problem is that's not how I processed it. I processed it as just like, I don't know why this, this story is second person. <laughs> we realize later that it's being told by someone right, else right. And, yeah and you don't know these, yeah yeah so so if you think of these as her thoughts you do think of her as a different type of person yeah um, and metathulu says in the chat that this feels like an intro to a computer game rpg it seems weird to start but it goes along it seems more natural and i i would agree with that like it, yeah. it does have that like you are she she is you you are soon like it's like commanding you the reader like this is who you are yeah um M- matthias um Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> Says um, "Turtles All the Way Down" by John Green has some second person stuff. I, I I haven't read that, but I remember hearing about it. And the idea there, I think, is that he's basically using that voice to like channel the particular mental illness of the narrator to make you kind of feel it more strongly and, and get swept up in it. Yeah, um, I need which, to read that book. Yeah, I think I should too. I like John Green. I just haven't read that one yet. Yeah, the the director is Hoa, the the, the narrator. Yeah, 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 yeah. And five six seven makes a good point. Um, this makes you think about the perspective of the stone eaters and how their emotional makeup is very different from humans. I think that's very true. Like they are kind of a cold, observant, um, inhuman race that we don't really know a lot about. Um, but I think to Matt's point, like because you because it's so much later in the story that you learn that this is being told from the perspective of a stone eater. I think you've probably forgotten like this particular slide. I probably had forgotten about the coldness, about the cheekiness by the time I learned that, Oh yeah, that's who is the one telling the story. Right. Right. And so, I mean, that arguably hurts it unless, unless we're going that this is a designed second read book. (laughs) Yeah. I I think we should move on. We'll try to figure that out. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to meet the second of our three main characters quote unquote, Demaya, who is being taken away by the guardian Shafa. Mother's jaw flexes. So you're really taking her to Eumenes then? Of course I... The man stares at her. Ah, he glances at Demaya. They both look at Demaya, their gazes like an itch. She squirms. So even thinking I was coming to kill your daughter, you had the calm headman summon me. Mother tenses. Don't. It, it wasn't. I didn't. At her sides, her hands flex. Then she bows her head as if she is ashamed, which Demaya knows is a lie. Mother isn't ashamed of anything she does. She's done. If she was, why would she do it? Ordinary people can't take care of of children like her, says Mother, very softly. Her eyes dart to Demaya's once and away, fast. She almost killed a boy at school. We've got another child and neighbors and... Abruptly, she squares her shoulders, lifting her chin. And it's any citizen's duty, isn't it? True, true, all of it. Your sacrifice will make the world better for all. The words are a stock phrase, praise. The tone is uniquely not. Demaya looks at the man again, confused now because child buyers don't kill children. That would defeat the point. And what's this about the Equatorials? Those lands are far, far to the south. The child buyer glances at Demaya and somehow understands that she does not understand. His face softens, which should be impossible with those frightening eyes of his. To Yemenes, the man says to mother, to Demaya. Yes, 
She's young enough, so I'm taking her to the fulcrum. There she will be trained to use her curse. Her sacrifice, too, will make the world better. So here's our, our introduction of the first guardian we meet, Shafa. Um, and I love this, Matt, because we introduce him as a nice guy. He's going to be the kind mentor character <laughs> to our to our little girl, right? It's yeah. such a fake out. It's such a yeah. fake out. Yeah, I was really um, almost like upset by this because I li- like you like him. Like the way he's introduced, he comes, he's nice to her. She's having a really hard time. He's he's really kind of like kind to her, goes out of his way to be kind to her. And and it it's not for a while until he starts to be kind of ba- like backhanded with her. And, and even then you're like, well, okay, like sometimes the sometimes the wise mentor has to um be uh, has to teach hard lessons yeah you have to teach hard lessons but it like but then like it kind of just keeps going and you're like okay at what point does it go from hard lessons to utter abuse and of course you know by the end of the story you're like yeah they're they're just psychopaths yeah Um, yeah but uh i I love it um I love like this is our kind of first introduction of how the world looks at Orogenes, right? Like we've had kind of a hint through Asun, but this is like we see like they were so terrified of her. They locked her in a barn and waited for the Guardian to come like they were 100 percent convinced that he was just going to come kill her. And they were just like, that's fine. Um, I love I love that that part where like she bowed her head as if ashamed, which to Maya knows is a lie. Mother isn't ashamed of anything she's done like this, this earnest belief that like her parents have basically written her off as dead um, Mm -hmm. and doesn't doesn't care and um, as Zach is saying in the chat he's introduced from a child's perspective we see we we see him as the kind wise um, protector that's going to take her away from the mother who doesn't give a shit about her and and take her to a better life Um, but we get little I think there are little bits in here but like she will be trained to use her curse like just just the fact that like we're we're establishing this from the get-go as a curse it's not a gift it's a curse mm-hmm. and that that lines up with how every every bit of this society looks at this power that the orogenies have yeah so i think probably this is one of the the more effective sad moments of the story is not 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 when she leaves necessarily but when she has the realization um prompted by shafa that like her family aren't monsters who hate her they were in it. They were absolutely in a bind where it was like either they have to give her up or like they're all going to be lynched. Yeah. And they're um, terrified of her, too. That's one of yeah. the, her big realizations is they, they were afraid of me. <laughs> yeah. They, they were afraid of her and they were afraid of even even if they tried to hide her or something, they just know that they wouldn't succeed right. and that they would be and, and like it would be worse for everyone. Um, and, and yeah, it's just it's very it's very very sad to especially you know to, to break out of this view because at least when she's angry at them she can be angry at them but yeah. once she realizes like actually they are very broken up about having to do this too then that makes it even worse yeah so. but again i think this is playing in tropes right like this is like the the kind old mentor taking the kid with power to become a wizard or to become the strong magic user like this seems to be going aligned with with a lot of other fantasy stories that we've seen and it's not until later that we learn that we're kind of we're exploring this in a much different kind of way yeah yeah speaking of uh why people are afraid of these people let's learn why people might be afraid of of the orogenies all right so i soon decides to leave her city but she's stopped at the gate by people who have finally figured out that she's a Raga. <gasps> That's a bad word, Matt. Yep. Can't say that word. I know. I'm sorry. You killed him. You say to Rask. This is not a rational thing. You mean you, plural, even though you're speaking to you specific. Rask didn't try to kill you. Had nothing to do with Uche. But the attempt on your life has triggered something raw and furious and cold. You cowards. You animals. Who look at a child and see prey. Jija is the one to blame for Uche. Some part of you knows that. But Jija grew up, he- grew up here in Tarimo. That kind of hate that can make a man murder his own son, it came from everyone around you. Rask inhales. Esun. And then the valley floor splits open. The initial jolt of this is violent enough. <laughs> Siri thought I was asking a question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
The initial jolt of this is violent enough to knock everyone standing to the ground and sway every house in Chirimo. Then those houses judder and rattle as the jolt smooths them in a steady, ongoing vibration. Sater's cart repair shop is the first to collapse, the old wooden frame of the building sliding sideways off its foundation. There are screams from inside, and one woman manages to run out before the door frame crumples inward. On the eastern edge of town, closest to the mountain ridges that f- frame the valley, a rock slide begins. A portion of the eastern calm wall and three houses are buried beneath a sudden grinding slurry of mud and trees and rocks. Far below the ground, where no one but you can detect, the clay walls of the underground aquifer that supplies the village wells are breached. The aquifer begins to drain. They will not realize for weeks that you killed the town in this moment, but they will remember when the wells run dry. Those who survive the next few moments will, anyhow. From your feet, the circle of frost and swirling snow begins to expand rapidly. And then she fucking ices them. Ices, ices those guys, kills a bunch of people, eventually comes to her senses and realizes she's killing, like, probably innocent children. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a, again, like, like I, I really have to conclude that, that it is intentional that we began with a protagonist who we didn't know just dumping on her. And now we have our, our protagonist who we don't have much reason to like just losing it and killing a bunch of people. And it's like, ju- it's like she's justified in defending herself. She's not justified in trying to kill everyone in the town, you know? No. Yeah. I mean the, the part that, um, the part that really jumped out at me is the, the aquifer begins to drain. They will not realize for weeks that you killed the town in this moment. That's such a de- decisive phrase. You, in that moment, like not just the people that you killed, you killed the entire calm. It's over. Um, and, and like, it, it is. I, I, you're, I think you're right that you're not supposed to know how to feel about a soon at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we were talking about how the language in the second person is kind of cold and a little jokey talk and cheeky talking about like some pretty serious stuff. And now she's just casually just murdered this entire town. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think you're supposed to know. And one of the things that jumped out at me, especially on the second read through, is this jump back to the you plural versus the you specific, which we saw in the prologue, we saw when um, the the rock eater was talking to who we'll learn later is Alabaster about mm-hmm. um, who's going to survive. They said uh, the rock eater said, "You will, you will still be here." And and the text notes they, they meant the you plural, and I think that's like very intentional, right? I think that's an intentional callback. We're connecting this moment to that moment. We're connecting this moment where um, he ends the world to her, this moment where she ends this town. Yeah. Um, and I also think we're connecting who the, the narrator is there and trying to draw a, a connection between those. Yeah. I, it, it's interesting. Cause I, I don't have a lot of confidence in this, but like, it seems to be indicating like the, the, the toxicity of thinking about people in terms of groups yeah. because she, she's basically lashing out and killing a group of people because of the sins of, you know, the one in this case. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Alabaster is killing a whole civilization because of, I mean, r- really because of a kind of complicity in what was done. But, but like, honestly, most of those people didn't know about, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the stations, whatever they were called. Yeah. The, the fact that those were like lobotomized children. So it's like, um, just j- the, the, the whole idea of using you, you plural is kind of a, is kind of a toxic idea, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, I, I think, I think she almost knows that because like it says it right here, some part of her knows that, but then she justifies it away. Jija grew up here in Tiramo. That the kind of hate that can make a man murder his own son. It came from everyone around you, which isn't true that it didn't like it, it didn't start here. Like the, the mm-hmm. hatred of the Orogenes didn't start in this little town. They don't hate them for no reason. They're taught to hate them. The culture has trained every single yeah. person in this society to hate these people. It is no it is no individual person in this society's fault the way the Orogenes are treated. Um, and, it, and it's just kind of like a, a very reckless, cold destruction of people. Yeah. Um, um, uh, five, six, seven points out that not only did she kill the people who were trying to kill her, but she also ices like the, the calm leader who was trying to help her and like going out of his way to help her, putting yeah. himself at risk actually. And like, that's, a that was one thing where I was like, well, I, that's not good. I don't, yeah, right. I don't, I don't like her in this moment. Yeah. Rask was really nice to her. Yeah. Um, really. I mean, like she could have, 
and, and we know we learn later about her that she has really good control. She's a four ringer. She gets more rings from Alabaster, but also it's very it's heavily hinted that she's actually more powerful than even that. Um, so she, we know she has really good control. She could just kill the person who tried to shoot her with a crossbow and then just leave. Right. Like she, that would, that would have made her point, but that's not what she's interested in doing here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like, one, and once you learn that this is, um, the, the same character as the girl from the beginning who was being cast out of her, of her city, there's almost a kind of like, she's getting revenge for something that happened when she was a child yeah. in a completely different context. Like she's lashing out. She's not, she's not even lashing out at Tarimo. She's lashing out at, um, you know, at, um, the, the town, world. the town, the, the town that, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the world, like, um, cause it reminds me of, uh, cause doesn't Rask say I had a, I had a sibling who was taken away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so, why he, that's why he empathizes with her. Cause he's lost a, a sibling. Yeah. And, and her reaction to that is to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. (laughs) Like, like I I don't basically, I don't forgive you, you know, which is really kind of a dark, bitter kind of thing to to have in the story. Yeah. There's a debate going on in the chat about whether or not this was a conscious choice of hers or she just kind of lost it in this moment and lashed out uncontrollably. Um, I I don't know. I, I I, I tend to think that she was doing this on person. Um, yeah, it wasn't an yes. accident. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think a little, maybe a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's uh, let's meet our our third and final character. Let's meet uh, Cyanite. I love that name. Yeah, it's like get it. It's like a rock. Yeah, they're all rocks. So Cyanite is a four ring orogeny, um, which just means she's has has passed four tests of skill. Uh, and and has been given a very important assignment. She jams a foot in the door's path before it can build up much momentum and leans in to say, I'm Cyanite. It doesn't mean anything to him. She can see by now his he, she can see by his now furious glare. He inhales to start shouting. She has no idea what, but she doesn't want to hear it. And before he can, she snaps. I'm here to fuck you, Earth Burn it. Is that the is that work disturbing your beauty rest? Part of her is appalled at her own language and her own anger. The rest of her is satisfied because that shuts him right the rut up. He lets her in. Now it's awkward. Cyan sits at the small table in a suite. A suite. He's got the whole suite of furnished rooms to himself and watches while he fidgets. He's sitting on one of the room's couches, pretty much perched on its edge. The far edge, she notes, as if he fears to sit too close to her. I didn't think it would be starting again this soon, he says, looking at his hands, which are laced together before him. I mean, they always tell me there's a need, but that's... I didn't... He sighs. Then this isn't the first time for you, Cyanide says. He only earned the right to refuse with his tenth ring. No, no, but... He takes a deep breath. I didn't always know. Didn't know what? He grimaces. With the first few women, I thought they were... Interested. You, then she gets it. The deniability is always there, of course. Even Feldspar never came right out and said, your assignment is to produce a child within a year with this man. The lack of acknowledgement is supposed to make it easier somehow. She's never seen the point. Why pretend that the situation is anything other than what it is? But for him, she realizes, it wasn't pretending. Which astounds her because, come on, how naive can he be? So... Here we go. <laughs> we have Cyanide, our last character who he introduces, this loud spoken, blunt, angry, kind of goes off at any moment type of character. And then we meet the most powerful uh, orogeny in the world, who is a guy who um, is didn't even, wasn't even aware that people were just using him to get babies for a while. Yeah. Um, and I think that's yeah. a perfect way to, int- to introduce these two characters because we see how different they are just right away. Yeah, and these two and their interactions and their part of the book, safe to say, is my favorite part of the story. Yeah, I agree. Uh, um, th- you know, their, their interplay, but both of them are very interesting. Like Cyanide is just like you said, this kind of like forthright, um, aggressive t- type of character, and and Alabaster has his own complicated quirks, and you you kind of like. I think I like Cyanide more than I like any of the other you know epochs of this of this woman. Um, I agree. Um, and, um, I guess the most happens really in, in terms of 
narrative, like interesting yeah. narrative beats in this, in this, this timeline. This book is Cyanite's story. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Demaya and Asun kind of just like begin and, and end it. Um, but really most of, most of the, the character change and, and move of the story is through the Cyanite character. Yeah. Who I feel yeah. bad using that name all the time because that's her slave name. Um, yeah. Which is something I think we have to kind of breach is the idea that what uh, Jemison is doing with the way Orogenes are treated here is is a very obvious slavery metaphor. Um, mm-hmm. Especially here when we start talking about like the idea of forced breeding where they are required because he is powerful. We need more like him. So we're going to breed more like him. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's I mean it's pretty rough. Like (laughs) it's, it's, it's like, I, I kind of love how we're slowly introduced to this. We like the book, like slowly drips information to understand how, how terrible these, these, the the lives of these people are. And we, we are introduced to cyanide as a person who was ordered to do this and complies like immediately. So like while she's loud spoken, while she's like kind of goes off and gets angry and has, is a very emotional person. She acquiesces to this and we understand kind of, like how how controlled and enslaved she is Mm -hmm. and the thing i love about the demaya arc is then we get to see how she got that way like how like we see cyan in the cyanide arc we see someone who has been indoctrinated and enslaved and completely controlled and we see how she breaks free of that that thought control system in demaya we see how that system is imprinted on her yeah i like what I, on that note, I like five, six, seven's comment that like before learning how bad the fulcrum was, they say, you know, I thought it was just kind of messed up, but maybe necessary. Yeah, um, that's like, true. like how the stone lore can be very coldly pragmatic. And and that's a good point because like you don't, you, the book, you trust the book to tell you how bad these things are. And, and cyanide actually just kind of, it, it's, She's acting like it's annoying, but not that bad, right. right? Like she's like, oh, whatever. This is just one of the one of the sh- crappy things about life, and like it takes you time to actually kind of like realize, like, oh, she's she's only accepting this in the first place because it's like death if she doesn't, right? Um, and and she's been, you know, com- like you said, indoctrinated, broken down, um, and and terrorized basically, and, yeah. and into a place where where she. Where, where basically her only remaining choice is to kind of have the attitude of like, well, better get it over with. Yeah. And her, her, her whole thing around it is like this pragmatic acceptance. Like that's what the, how naive can he be line at the end of the section is, is like, how could you have ever believed that this, that, that people wanted to sleep with you because they liked you. <laughs> um, and it, it, where his is like, he seems like so much. So, and we don't really get to see any of his backstory, right? Like we get hints at it, at, at what, ha- at what must have happened to him to, to turn him into the person he is. But like, he never seems like he's always the one pushing against the system. And he actually, I think like, like we'll see in a, a maybe, maybe one or two slides from now, like how he's, I think he's kind of imprinting his desire onto her like the things he wants out of life he's putting that onto her when i don't think she's quite there yet Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. yeah right i mean he's definitely a lot more broken out of the system than she is he's aware of a lot more of the atrocities he's already like scared away his guardian somehow yeah we never learn what he did (laughs) he did to that guardian i kind of like that i kind of like that it was just like what what did you do to him or her (laughs) yeah yeah all right, so let's uh, let's move on to the next one. All right, so in this one, uh, we're back with the Maya now as she journeys to the Fulcrum, the training place for Orogenes. She asks Chaffa for a story, and he tells her this wonderful, pleasant one. <laughs> we didn't pull the whole story because it's too long. We just pulled the, the introduction part of it. Okay. Long ago, during the season of Teeth, that's hmm, the third season after Sanze's founding, maybe 1,200 years ago, an orogeny named Misylum decided to try to kill the emperor. This was back when emperor actually did things, mind, and long before the fulcrum was established. Most orogenies had no proper training in those days. Like you, they acted purely on emotion and instinct. On the rare occasions that they managed to survive childhood, Misylum had somehow managed to not only survive, but to train himself. He had superb control, perhaps to the fourth or fifth ring level. What? He nudges her leg again. Rankings used by the fulcrum. Stop interrupting. 
Demaya blushes and obeys. Superb control, Shafa continues, which Masalem promptly used to kill every living soul in several towns and cities, and even a few calmless warrens. Thousands of people in all. Demaya ho- inhales, horrified. It was never. It, it has never occurred to her that ragas. She stops herself. She is a raga. All at once, she does not like this word, which she has heard most of her life. It's a bad word she's not supposed to say, even though the grown-ups toss it around freely, and suddenly it seems uglier than it already did. Orogenes, then. It is terrible to know that Orogenes can kill so many so easily, but then she supposes that is why people hate them. Her. That is why people hate her. Why did he do that, she asks, forgetting that she should not interrupt. Why, indeed. Perhaps he was a bit mad. Shafa leans down so that she can see his face, crossing his eyes and waggling his eyebrows. This is so hilariously unexpected that Demaya giggles, and Shafa gives her a conspiratorial smile. Or perhaps Masalim was simply evil. Regardless, as he approached Eumenes, he sent word ahead, threatening to shatter the city walls if its, if its people did not send the emperor out to meet him and die. So then the rest of the story is the emperor brings the very first guardian, um, which knew how knew about Orogenes and banished and defeats him. It's this, the birth of guardians um, and their control system. And um, he ends the story. And this is, I think this is when he breaks her hand at the end of the story Yeah. Um, to, to demonstrate the power of himself. And this is when he shifts from being the good old mentor to something a lot more darker. And I love this too, because like you can see this, this, this is a story of indoctrination into their belief system, right? Like, they you kind of see it happen in her her realization that i'm a raga like i people hate me like it, it's like she's it's becoming imprinted on herself who she is and she's letting this story be the thing that defines how she and everyone else feels about her mm-hmm. um and it's it's really tragic and like he's still joking around with it like i i love this moment where like perhaps he's a bit mad and then he he crosses his eyes and waggles his eyebrows and and it's like ah oh, that's so funny and then it, it goes darker from there yeah. and then by the end of this interaction he's broken her hand and then basically said to her like what have you learned and it's like you'll hurt me if i don't obey yeah what else it's like you'll hurt me if you feel like it's the right thing to do even if i do nothing and that's just like holy shit yeah. like it, it's it's like and it's it's devastating too and and i think what we've been talking about is like you're you're right in that the only really thing we've seen around orogeny use at this point is Asun destroying a town and Alabaster destroying the world, right? So I think we as the readers still don't quite know what to make of this whole thing. Right. And it takes us a while before I mean the story the story continues to play with this idea, actually, because yeah. we later learn that Miss Salem um was basically getting what is portrayed by um i believe alabaster i think it was alabaster yeah um, as being just like justified revenge um yeah because the empire was eating people yeah uh they were cannibals ate his family yeah his whole whole family yeah um so so it, it puts that in a different context but but it's all still very complicated to me because like the the point here, like at this point in the story, it's like ah, the hero, the he, like Shafa's point. Shafa's point is, you are not the hero. The erogeny never gets to be the hero. Yeah. Um, the hero is the is the person, the human who manages to kill the erogeny. Um. But then, like, I don't think it makes sense to invert it and be like, actually, he was the hero. He's like, well, if but he killed a bunch of people. I guess they were bad too, but like, can yeah. we just not kill people en masse <laughs> nope. as a solution to our problems? Nope. <laughs> no, I guess that's what we're doing. Okay. Yep. yep that's what we're doing. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that, that's arguing is the system has become so stagnant and unchanging um, that it needs to be torn down. I think is one of the things that the book is arguing. Uh-huh. Um, and I think that's kind of what we'll see at the end of it. Um, and that's, I mean, I, that's kind of threaded throughout the entire book, this idea that like you do things because it's written down in stone lore. You don't understand why it's just a stone tablet told you to do it, told you to do it that way. We we can't exist any other way. And part of the character's journey throughout the story is seeing people that exist in other ways outside the ways of the empire, outside the ways of Fulcrum um, and them learning that those ways can be successful. Yeah. Yeah. I love this idea of stone lore because it's like 
knowledge that has been accrued through natural selection, basically. Yeah. Where you're like, man, you really would be a fool to not obey that. Even if it tells you to do something reprehensible, you're like, well, I mean, <laughs> right. I mean it's in there. And I bet the people who didn't do that are dead now. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the that's the, the different. Um, that's a, that's the a challenge of this this world, right? Is that the challenge of like deciding how you feel about. Yeah. What's all, what all is going on? Yeah, I mean, tiger sharks eat each other in the womb. And we don't blame them for that. That's just their nature. That's the nature of their reality. And so, like, do you blame these people for being brutal when their world is this brutal? I think that's a very interesting question. Right, right, yeah. 567 points out that that raga, the word, is um, is is pretty clearly supposed to be an analogy for the n-word and Mm -hmm. and in this in the context of that we kind of see how a child starts to internalize the derogatory term and understands the prejudice behind it Um, and that's very true and then later in the book they point out that cyanet realizes what's going on with the node maintainers which we're about to get to and how like that is the most fitting word and and we see alabaster uses that word quite a lot and we kind of see why he's like it's not that he's taken the word back it's just that it's just an accurate statement of what what the fulcrum has done to these people that they're, they're not they're not people anymore they've been reduced to just that that slang word yeah which is awful it's terrible yeah. you know it took me most of the book to figure out that raga was supposed to be short for orogeny oh really yeah <laughs> okay. I mean, like orogeny raja i guess, I guess that's a i guess that's a audiobook yeah. symptom yeah probably <laughs> All right, so we've moved back to Cyanite and Alabaster, and they are like on the road traveling together. This is the one part of the book where you kind of feel happy because, like, it's just like a silly kind of traveling, not romance, because they're like being forced to sleep together, and that feels weird to call it a romance, but they don't like each other. They're kind of like brutal and hostile with each other, but uh, I think that makes for entertaining dialogue. Mm-hmm. And now here, Alabaster has decided he knows exactly what's wrong with Cyanite. I think you hate me because I'm someone you can hate. I'm here. I'm handy. But what you really hate is the world. At this, Cyan tosses her washcloth into the bowl of water she's been using and glares at him. The world doesn't say inane things like that. I'm not interested in mentoring a sycophant. I want you to be yourself with me. And when you are, you can barely speak a civil word to me, no matter how civil I am to you. Hearing it put that way, She feels a little guilty. What do you mean, then, that I hate the world? You hate the way we live, the way the world makes us live. Either the fulcrum owns us, or we have to hide and be hunted down like dogs if we're ever discovered, or we become monsters and try to kill everything. Even within the fulcrum, we always have to think about how they want us to act. We can never just be. He sighs, closing his eyes. There should be a better way. There isn't. There must be. Sanzi can't be the first empire that's managed to survive a few seasons. We can see the evidence in other ways of life, other people who become mighty. He gestures around from the high road, towards the landscape that spreads all around them. They're near the great eastern forest, nothing but a carpet of trees rising and falling, as far as the eyes can see. Except, except just at the edge of the horizon, she spots something that looks like a skeletal metal hand clawing its way out of the trees. Another ruin and it must be truly massive as she can see it from here. So I like this because I really think he's like putting his beliefs on her mm-hmm. in a way. Like I don't, I'm sure like I, I agree that cyanide is frustrated with the world, but I don't think she quite lines up with what he's saying here. Mm-hmm. And this yeah. is, this is clearly what he thinks and what he wants. He, he thinks that this is, this is a bum rap. He hates it. Um, he wants there to be a better way and he wants to search for that better way. She's not there yet. She's getting there. I mean, I think that the moment here where she looks out and sees the evidence of another way that that hand poking out of the forest um, is is a step towards her coming to that realization, which a lot of this early part of her arc in the story is her coming to that realization. But um, it's mostly him. And yeah. I, I find it interesting that he puts that on her. Yeah, I, I'm of two minds about it because I can see like, that he he knows that she probably has like she feels this way deep inside her but never in a way that's articulated like she doesn't lie awake at night yeah thinking like th- thinking i want to be free like I, I i resent the fulcrum she doesn't have these thoughts but that doesn't mean that 
they they aren't true. Like and 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 sure, does, yeah. it doesn't mean they don't resonate with her. Um, and may, and maybe it takes time for them to start resonating before she kind of like gets enough time and space away from the fulcrum that she can let go of her fear. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's definitely kind of deprogramming her very subtly. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's, I mean, I think that's part of his mission here too. Yeah. Um, is, is that that's what he's trying to do with, with stuff like this. Yeah. Like that we never, we never learn why the node explodes, right? Um, the node just kind of randomly explodes and then they go to the node, but I think he had already decided they were going to a node to make her see. So I think it was all part of his plan was, I'm going to show this person the truth of what's going on. Um, I forget. I, I thought, I mean, I thought the node maintainer like lashed out and killed everyone in a moment of. Yeah. I mean, it, he caused it, but we don't like know like why or how, like how often does that happen? Like mm. if, if that's a thing that happens all the time, that seems like it would be bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he just happened to be around there and an obelisk just, did they use an obelisk to stop that? I can't remember. Uh, I think they might have. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think actually like she, she tapped into it and then he like used her, he like t- took her power and controlled it or something yeah. like that. Yeah. It's been a while. Um, can I just mention how much I like stories that have like ancient relics of past technological civilizations? Yeah. It's I, one of I, my favorite things. I like it a lot too. And I, and I like it, you know, functionally here too. I mean, it is just kind of neat, but also it's like we're being told by the culture and the story over and over again that our way is the only way this is this is what we have to do to survive this is the only way to survive and we keep seeing little hints and bits of no maybe not maybe there's other things maybe something else is going on here that we don't understand and we're about to get to a point where the the book kind of like directly addresses that to to us the reader yeah well, i mean i, I always the, the obelisks are my favorite because and and like you could, you knew they were going to come into play right but just like oh yeah and then there's giant floating obelisks yeah they're introduced so casually right yeah. it's just like oh yeah this is just a thing that exists in this world um yeah. no one knows what they are what they do they just kind of float around and <laughs> we're all yeah. just cool with it they wander around randomly in the sky <laughs> yeah whatever oh, it's just a yeah, yeah. I mean, That's it's, funny. It's, it's another day tuesday yep. obelisk yep. day so Alabaster, in this next scene, with science help, manages to stop a giant volcano from exploding. Uh, they head to the node, and uh, which is a protective place where an orogeny should be stopping all seismic activity in the region to find out what's going on. Then Cyan finds the node chamber. That's what it has to be. It's in the middle of the building, through an elegant archway decorated with pale rose marble and embossed tree root designs. The chamber beyond is high and vaulted and dim, but empty, except in the room's center, where there's a big thing. She would call it a chair if it was made of anything but wires and straps. Not very comfortable looking, except in that it seems to hold its occupant at an easy recline. The node maintainer is seated in it anyway, so it must be... Oh. Oh. Oh, bloody burning earth. Alabaster standing on the dais that holds the wire chair, looking down at the node maintainer's body. He doesn't look up as she comes near. His face is still, not sad or bleak, just a mask. Even the least of us must serve the greater good, he says, with no irony in his voice. The body in the node maintainer's chair is small and naked, thin, its limbs atrophied, hairless. There are small things, tubes and pipes and things, she has no words for them, Going into the stick arms, down the goggle throat, across the narrow th- crotch, there's, an, there's a flexible bag on the corpse's belly, attached to its belly somehow, and it's full of, ugh, the bag needs to be changed. She focuses on all this, these little details, because it helps, because there's a part of her that's gibbering, and the only way she can keep that part internal and silent is to concentrate on everything she's seeing. Ingenious, really, what they've done. But she sees the bigger picture, too, in spite of her effort to concentrate on the minutia. The node maintainer, a child, kept like this for what what must have been months or years. A child whose skin is almost as dark as alabaster's and whose features might be a perfect match for his if they weren't so skeletal. There we have it. This is the the dark secret of the fulcrum is that each one of these node chambers is powered by a, a kid orogeny. Um, some of the who are clearly Alabaster's children. Yeah. Um, and I think we learned a bit, little bit later that like all of his children 
no matter how their skill with orogeny end up this way. Um, yeah. Yeah. That right. because there's, like, there's no other 10 rings. And she's like, wait, all, all his kids have the potential to be 10 rings, but there's no other 10 rings in the world. Where are they all going? Mm. Oh, yeah. Here's where they're going. Yeah. And this is one of the things, this is like one of the reasons why he's so broken and, and so full of rage at, at this system. Yeah. Is like he, he he does feel some connection with these children, even though he never really meets them. And you get the feeling that like he already knew that they were his kids, right? Like th- this yeah. is this is not a revelation for him. I mean, he definitely knew what was going on inside the node chambers, but like I don't think it's a reveal for him that that's what's happening to his children. Either. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. I, I I think I think he just wanted her to see it. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's really rough. And this is, I think when we're turning, like, this is when the book is starting to turn you towards the, oh, wait, no, this, this system, even, even if necessary for survival is deeply broken and wrong and terrible. Yeah. Um, uh, Metathulu asks, has skin color come up before this? Um, yeah, a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they mention it's interesting because they, the, the the book kind of contextualizes skin color as meaning things, but it's confusing what it means exactly. Like like all the people in the world know like, oh, the people from X latitudes have lighter skin. The people yeah. from Y latitudes have darker skin. But like my brain just immediately forgot that information because yeah. it 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 like it didn't it didn't correspond to like Earth uh, skin color distribution very well. So I just kind of like I don't know what to do with that. So I, yeah. Um, and, and like, and I know, I mean, what's interesting though is, um, <laughs> uh, at this point we, we got, we got a description of, um, Isun actually in terms of skin color and hair mm-hmm. color and everything, but we, we, we really avoided too much physical description of cyanite or the, the girl, uh, because they're the, the same person. Yeah. Yeah, because it's yeah. kind of avoiding, yeah, it's kind of avoiding that. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and one of the thing we get is that, uh, Shafa, uh, her guardian, has very, very, very white skin. Yeah. It's one thing the book takes pains to show out that she is very white. Which I mean, again, we're 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 going back to our slavery metaphor. Like this is not this is not subtle. Um, yeah. The the book is very clearly exploring these things. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, because uh, it's a it's a particular kind of slavery, right? Like, right. like many many civilizations in human history have had slavery, but yes. The the American version of slavery was was actually among the worst. Yeah. In in, in the sense of like de- complete dehumanization w- was part of it because in in most slave cultures it's it, like you could like the slave could buy their freedom and stuff like that and then like they could kind of go back into society maybe and I don't know maybe yeah. I'm maybe I'm gilding what it actually was in like Rome but anyway that's my impression of it. Yeah. But, but this full- is much. Yeah. Full full disclosure, Matt is not condoning slavery by no. saying that. <laughs> no, no, it's more it's more like there's there's certainly different levels of how horrible it can be. Yeah. And and this is very similar to the American form of slavery and how horrible it is. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I agree hundred percent with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean this was I, I think this was a really rough moment. This is when like this fun kind of adventure story between these two characters took a turn. Which is funny because like the book kind of makes you forget <laughs> that you're in a story where the beginning is the world ending. Um and you're like, oh, they're just going on this fun romp and they're just going on a mission and they're just gonna get to this town and remove some coral and everything's gonna be great. And oh wait, no, look, there's a deeply broken system in place here that is is has entrapped them all. Yeah, right. All right, now we get to our first of two interludes in the story, Matt. And uh, I wanted to put this in here because, again, this is another thing that on rereads becomes almost obvious in what it's doing. A break in the pattern. A snarl in the weft. There are things you should be noticing here. Things that are missing and conspicuous by their absence. Notice, for example, that no one in the stillness speaks of islands. That is not because they do not exist or are uninhabited. Quite the contrary. It is because islands tend to form near faults or atop hot spots, which means they are ephemeral things on the planetary scale. They're with an eruption and gone with the next tsunami. But human beings, too, are ephemeral things in the planetary scale. The number of things they do not notice are literally astronomical. People in the stillness do not speak of other continents, either, though it is plausible to suspect they might exist elsewhere. No one has traveled around the world to see that there aren't any, 
seafaring is dangerous enough with resupply in sight, and tsunami waves that are only a hundred feet high, rather than the legendary mountains of water said to ripple across the unfettered deep ocean. They simply take as given the bit of lore passed down from braver civilizations that say there's nothing else. Likewise, no one speaks of celestial objects, though the skies are as crowded and busy here as anywhere else in the universe. This is largely because so many of the people's attention is directed towards the ground, not the sky. They notice what's there, stars, and the sun, and the occasional comet or falling star. They do not notice what's missing. But then, how can they? Who misses what they have never, ever even imagined? That would not be human nature. How fortunate, then, that there are more people in this world than just humankind. Yeah, definitely needs a reread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is like almost shouting at you like, hey, there's no yeah. there's no moon. Stars. Where did the moon go? The sun. <laughs> comets. Can't think of anything else. It's what What is a thing Why? that its disappearance could maybe cause yeah. catastrophic geological events all over the planet? Right. I don't and, know. And, and I mean, I think you and I talked about this, how um, when they tell the story of, of Father Earth formerly having a partner and yeah. then the partner was destroyed or lost or killed yeah. or whatever. The reason why then, Father Earth hates mankind is because they took away his partner. Yeah. So, I mean, my assumption throughout this has been that this is not Earth, that this is an alien planet that was colonized by humans. It may, it may be that it's actually Earth and that, and that she's saying, like, maybe this is what happens to Earth when you, you know— use technology to, to do something to the moon. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter either way. I, I, I guess I like the idea that it's not earth cause then it's like implies a much greater technological fall. Um, plus yeah. I'm just a sucker for, um, fallen colony stories. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we have these stone eaters like th- this, how fortunate then, then there are more people in this world than just humankind. Yeah. Um, th- this is a stone eater talking to us and, uh, I believe they're talking about their race, which, uh, we just, don't, yeah, we don't know anything about, but Which, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I've just read this first book, but I just I view them as like some kind of like energy being that lives within the earth itself. And then when it's convenient, it makes a little like projection out of out of rock. Yeah. Um, and it has yeah. to eat certain rocks to turn into a little boy. <laughs> yeah. For for a reason. Yeah, it makes I mean, a little rock sarcophagus. I'm going to be honest, guys, I didn't pull any Hoa slides because uh, it's just such a confusing character that I don't know what to do with yet. Um yeah, we will be talking around Hoa because we have to, but uh, we just don't know anything about him, really. Yeah, we don't really understand what the Stone Eaters are, what they want, why this is happening. I mean, that's probably the the most limiting thing about doing, and we've encountered this many times in in the book club. Is when we, when you read the first book in a series, you you're just limited. You can't you right. can only say so much about what the book is yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, Brendan says in chat, Gumshoes Carmen San Diego has taken the moon. <laughs> again yeah <laughs> all right yeah i just love i just i love this on reread it's like so like it's like how did you miss like they they the number of things they do not notice are literally astronomical that's the book like yelling at you uh uh-huh. like 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 the, the cosmos like yeah. in the sky for example <laughs> like these following objects right right uh yeah all right next slide uh, spoilers, one of the big reveals of the novel is that Asun, Cyanite, and Demaya are the same person. <gasps> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this part of the novel, uh, Asun, unsure what to do next, uh, it's actually a pretty big hint toward all that. Yeah, I love this. I, this is another one of those in retrospect parts of the book. Yeah. You think maybe you need to be someone else. You're not sure who. Previous yous have been stronger and colder or warmer and weaker Either set of qualities is better suited to getting you through the mess you're in. Right now, you're cold and weak, and that helps no one. You could become someone new, maybe. You've done that before. It's surprisingly easy. A new name, a new focus. Then try on the sleeves and slacks of a new personality and find the perfect fit. A few days, and you'll find, and you'll feel like you've never been anyone else. But only you, only one you is Nasun's mother. That's what's forestalled you so far, and ultimately, it's the deciding factor. At the end of all this, when Jija is dead and it's finally safe to mourn your son, if she still lives, Nasun will need the mother she's known all her life. So you must stay Asun, and Asun will have to make do with the broken bets of herself that Jija has left behind. 
you'll jigsaw them together however you can. Caulk in the odd bits with willpower whenever they don't quite fit. Ignore the occasional sounds of grinding and cracking. As long as nothing important breaks, right? You'll get by. You have no choice. Not as long as one of your children could be alive. So this is, again, like I think the book kind of yelling at you that these are all the same people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because even the, you know, stronger stronger and colder is cyanite. Yeah. Warm, warmer and weaker is the Maya. Exactly. Like, it's it, it becomes very clear in retrospect. Um, yep. But, I mean, outside of that, I mean, it's just like a, a lot of Asuns struggle through this. And we don't realize it until the book tells us that they're all the same person. But at this point, all we know is that their struggle is, you know, finding their purpose in this life. And, and Asun has kind of set herself up as um, her entire purpose at this point is to find her husband and kill him and take her final child if she's still alive. And if not, well, she's going to kill him anyway. And that's, she set her entire sight on that. She has nothing else. She has no other goal, no other purpose. Um, and that's all she wants to do. And, yep. um, she can't, she can't move on to a new person until that thing has been achieved. Yep. I also like, um, the, this book has a lot of like geology and, and rock based, verbiage to it like a lot of language in it and and it gets like very clear here right like when um you'll jigsaw them together caulk the odd bits with willpower wherever they don't quite fit ignore the occasional sounds of grinding and cracking there's nothing as long as nothing important breaks and i love like in a world of unstable um tectonic motion this idea of constructing yourself of bits of clay and and caulked bits and and like it's in this inherently unstable world with an inherently unstable construction um, it's like saying, yeah, uh, important parts are going to break. <laughs> it's going to yeah. gonna do it. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I hadn't, I put, hadn't put that together. Yeah. That's, that's a great way of using the, um, letting the theme resonate through the setting and the characters and all those things that, the, that that's the stuff that we love. Yeah. Um, so now we move on to Demaya now at the fulcrum and we've been kind of circling around her indoctrination into the system before. And this is, I think the part of the book where it becomes very real, where we see actually Demaya start to change. You are representatives of us all. The instructors say, if any grit dares to protest this treatment, when you're dirty, all erogenies are dirty. When you're lazy, we're all lazy. We hurt you. So you'll do the rest of us. No harm. Once Demaya would have protested the unfairness of such judgments, the children of the fulcrum are all different. Different ages, different colors, different shapes. Some speak sans mat with different accents, having originated from different parts of the world. One girl has sharp teeth because it's in her race's custom to file them. Another boy has no penis, though he stu stuffs a sock into his underwear after every shower. Another girl has rarely had regular meals and wolfs down every one like she's starving. The instructors keep finding food hidden in and around the bed. They make her eat it. All of it, in front of them, even if it makes her sick. One cannot reasonably expect sameness out of so much difference, and it makes no sense for Demaya to be judged by the behavior of children who share nothing save the curse of orogeny with her. But Demaya understands now that the world is not fair. They are orogenies, the misalums of the world, born cursed and terrible. This is what is necessary to make them safe. Anyway, if she does what she's supposed to do, no unexpected things happen. Her bed is always perfect, her teeth clean and white. When she starts to forget what matters, she looks at her right hand, which twinges now and again on cold days, through the bones he though the bones healed within a few weeks. She remembers the pain and the lessons it taught. So this is tragic. And I, I love, I didn't pick up on this when I pulled the slide, but you're talking about this general idea of grouping and and making one representative of the all and we see it again here we see this 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 again viewpoint that one of them represents all of them yeah it's it's the you plur plural like you said right. you, you represent all of us yeah um yeah i, I mean the the hand twinging i think that was actually a big clue because I, I, i'm pretty sure the hand twinges in the cyanite storyline i think you're probably right and, and that makes me think and that was the one that was the first thing that made me start suspecting these are the same character um but yeah that i mean there's it's all terrible and dehumanizing and I, I think like here's the thing <laughs> the demise storyline is like brutal and painful and just like not fun yeah and 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 the assumed storyline is is grinding and and tragic and and sad and also painful the cyanide storyline has some horrible stuff in it but it's the only one that kind of feels like an adventure 
That's, yeah. Like, that's why I like it the most is it lets you, it lets you kind of enjoy it for a while. I'm like, I'm not saying all books should be stuff that I can enjoy and have a fun time reading. Uh, I'm just saying like, that's probably why I prefer that, that storyline. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it, it makes like, obviously Jemison decided to tell the story this way. Like she could have just told it in order, right? She could have just told the story of this woman um, through her doctrination, through her, her young life and, and into the broken person she is by the the end of her story, which is really the beginning of the whole story. Mm. But she decided not to do it that way. She decided to do it in layers like, like strata, like layers of the mountain. Um, yeah. Anyway, but I, I think, I think there's, there's an, there's, there's an intent behind the structure. Um, and it's, it's how, how the author is teaching us about this world, that it's not doing it in just a chronological order. It's not, we're not just seeing this girl's life laid out in front of us. We're seeing all the different moments of her life and, and, and how, like how one impacts the other, but in kind of an out of order way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like one could sit down and put a lot of energy into tracing out why the scenes are ordered the way they are, you know? Yeah, I think you could do that. We don't have time. <laughs> no. I, th I thought about doing that, actually. But I, th the thing that really is heartbroken here, and I think this is something that Jemison does really well, is this 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 basic understanding of how one um, is convinced to hate themselves and one convinced to see themselves as lesser. And, like, w we start off with her. She's like, this isn't fair. Like, we're all different kind of people. How could How could one of us represent all of us? That doesn't make any sense. But now I understand it's not fair. And furthermore, as long as I don't do anything wrong, everything's fine. And mm -hmm. that's how you teach people behavior, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, yes, the system might be unfair, but as long as I operate within it, as long as you do exactly what you're told, you'll be treated fine. It's when you dis it's when you disobey. It's when you don't that you get punished. And if you all just collectively obey everything that you're asked, nothing bad happens. And it's like this, it's so like insidious and terrible and, true to how slaves were treated in in real life yeah right it's it's you know you'll, you'll be safe and and no one will bother you as long as you follow the rules and yeah, as, yeah as just long kind as of you do every little thing bend, we say yeah it just kind of bends you that's terrible yeah yep all right so here cyanide and alabaster arrive in alia and in the process of clearing the harbor of coral for the town cyanide, cyanide discovers an obelisk buried beneath it Attempting to move it wakes it up, drawing a lot of attention. This results in the Guardians coming to hunt the two down for reasons. <laughs> Cyanite here breaks free from her indoctrination. But as Edki walks toward her with the poniard ready, there is a tightness around her eyes, a grim set to his mouth, sorry, his eyes, a grim set to his mouth, which makes her think of how she feels when she has a bad headache. This is what makes her blurt. Uh, are you uh, uh, all right? She has no idea why she asks this. At this, Ed Key cocks his head. The smile returns to his face, gentle and surprised. How kind you are. I'm fine, little one, just fine. But he's still coming at her. She scrambles backward again, tries to get her feet again, tries again to reach for her power, and fails in all three efforts. Even if she could succeed, though, he's a guardian. It's her duty to obey. It's her duty to die if he wills it. This is not right. Please, she says, desperate, wild with it. Please, we haven't done anything wrong. I don't understand. I don't. You need not understand, he says with perfect kindness. You need only do one thing. And then he lunges, aiming the poniard at her chest. Later, she will understand the sequence of events. Later, she will realize everything occurred in the span of a gasp. For now, however, it is slow. The passage of time becomes meaningless. She is aware only of the glass knife, huge and sharp, its facets gleaming in the fading dusk. It, it seems to come at her gracefully, gradually, drawing out her duty-bound terror. This has never been right. She becomes aware that she is angry, furious. Duty be damned. What this guardian is doing, what all guardians do, is not right. And then, and then, and then, she becomes aware of the obelisk. We are the gods in chains, and this is not rusting right. And then she activates a volcano and nukes an entire town. Nukes an entire, yet again. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I struggle. <laughs> <laughs> I struggle with the uh, with the fact that every time this character does anything, she has to kill a town. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I think I think part of what this is exploring is this fundamental understanding that the system is so broken um, that there is only one way to escape from it, and that is to annihilate it. Um. Yeah, I guess I don't know. I like a, a certain part of me was reading this as like, okay, everywhere this woman goes, she kills hundreds or thousands of people yeah it, happen, it happens multiple times it happens like three times at, at least maybe more like maybe she just needs to start making better choices and be, <laughs> being more careful I, I don't know and this like, to me this to me as i think where where i have trouble with the central metaphor of slavery right that like if we're connecting back this back to what um what the americas did to black people um this person has a great immense power and ability to wipe out uh, by herself entire towns casually, right? Yeah. So I, I just worry that like there's a lot of problematic things attached in that metaphor when you give that person that level of singular power. Right, it because it, because it, then it, it becomes rational in a sense to fear. Right, and that, and who... that's not that's not what I want people to be, t- and I don't think that's what Jemison wants people to be taking from this like that's not especially if you're if you're specifically making this a metaphor to slavery um that's not what you want people thinking at all yeah i mean they're they're obviously right that this is unjust and right yeah i mean totally i'm not i'm not challenging that at all right it's it's more like um you you this the solution is going to be is still going to be some kind of system of of like control because you still have to go find the erogenies in the wild and 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 train them so that they don't accidentally cause massive devastation right it's just a matter of not treating them as if they are subhuman and right. um cursed and rather because i mean the the secret the secret truth of this entire story is that the only reason the world exists as it is in the story is because of the orogenies without them society probably would have collapsed and that's that's i think one of the fun things that we really kind of just skipped over one of the fun things about their mission to go clear this coral from this area is the world is reliant on these people. It needs them. It mm-hmm. needs them to function, and yet it hates them. And yeah. um, it it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. But then you see moments like this where they blow up towns. <laughs> yeah, I think one of my favorite scenes is when they go talk to the um, the the government functionary for yeah. for that town. And I tried to fit that in. Just in yeah. The- it's I mean I mean it's ba- it's it's pretty long, and I mean it's basically just like ah oh, this is delightful. Because they're just giving her such a hard time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean that, that that's that. This is really my own main problem with the central with that central slavery metaphor. I think it it kind of falls apart a bit there, but I still like it. Um, yeah. But okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about, like I love I love the writing here. We haven't really talked about the the writing specifically in this section, like the 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 re- repetition of this is not right. Mm-hmm. Um, that that goes on throughout this. And like, I think my favorite part about it, my favorite part of this whole thing is when she asks the guardian, if he's all right, mm-hmm. like this moment where he's walking towards her with a sword and she sees that he, he looks miserable in his head and, and her, and like, this is a good way of showing how much the indoctrination still has hold of her, that, that she is so indoctrinated to reverence and respect of the guardians that, she blurts out without thinking, are you all right to mm-hmm. him? Um, yeah. And I, I love, I, I think that that's fascinating. And it's like, she, and so we're seeing like in this one little bit, her going, like we're seeing that break and fall apart because we establish it and then slowly we break it. This is not right. This has never been right. What the guardians do is not right. And then we are the gods in chains. Yeah. Um, and that that's like the slow, slow move of that. And then like, we, I didn't copy it here, but this the the are you all right beat ends again or comes back again when she's talking to the stone eater inside the obelisk that's the thing she asks to the stone eater and the obelisk uh, right before it explodes the town <laughs> yep um and i think that's like I, to, I mean, what was your interpretation of that like she asked it to the guardian um and then she asks it to the the stone eater at the end was that just like she's she's totally shifted in her belief system sure yeah i don't know i mean i i I completely agree with your interpretation of why she says it to the guardian um that this is the last shred of her of her automatic programming kind of responding almost like she's like i don't even understand why i would say that in this situation um 
as for why she would say to the stone eater, it's maybe she's just she's just a, the kind of person who cares about other people and realizes that it's a living thing. I don't know. Maybe don't know. she's got a new master now. Yeah, maybe. I don't think that's I don't no. think that's true. But no, uh, no. Zach says plantations were also built on slave ba- labor and emancipation destroyed those communities for the better. That's very true. But it yeah, didn't like didn't it didn't like literally everyone. destroy them. <laughs> yeah, it it uh, it it dismantled them. It, it restored justice in the sense of you you have freed the slaves and, yeah. and now the people who relied on the slavery have to find a new thing to rely on. So. Yeah, and then we and then we stopped restoring that justice after Lincoln died, and that yeah. was awesome. We just that was great. That was great. Not getting into that. Not this no. book. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, where were we? I lost it now. Ah, okay. So we're back with Demaya, and Demaya meets a new friend, Binoff, who has snuck into the fulcrum. She wants Demaya to show her a hidden room, and in it they find this mysterious uh, depression in the ground. So let's look into that. At the core of it, however, there is indeed a depression. That is an understatement. It's a huge, tapering pit with flat sided walls and neat, precise edges. Six of them, cut as finely as one cuts diamond. Evil Earth, Demaya whispers as she edges forward along the walkway to where the yellow lights line the shape of the pit. Yeah, says Benoff, sounding equally odd. It is stories deep, this pit, and steep. If she fell in, she would roll down its slopes and probably break every bone in her body at the bottom. But the shape of it nags at her, because it is faceted, tapering to a point at the very bottom. No one digs a pit in that shape. Why would they? It would be almost impossible to get out of, even with a ladder that could reach so far. But then, no one has dug this pit. She can cess that. Something monstrously heavy punched this pit into the earth and sat in the depression long enough to make make the rock and soil beneath it solidify into these smooth, neat planes. Then, whatever it was lifted away, clean as a buttered roll from a pan, leaving nothing but the shape of itself behind. But wait, the walls of the pit are not wholly smooth. Demaya crutches for a closer look, while besides her, Benoff just stares. There, along every smooth slope, she can see thin, barely visible, sharp objects. Needles? They push up through the fine cracks and smooth walls, jagged and random, like plant roots. The needles are made of iron. Demaya can smell the rust in the air. Scratch her earlier guess. If she fell into this pit, she would be shredded long before she ever hit the bottom. I wasn't expecting this, Benoff breathes at last. She's speaking in a hush, maybe out of reverence or fear. Many things, but not this. What is it? asks Demaya. What's it for? Benoff shakes her head slowly. It's supposed to be hidden, says a voice behind them, and they both jump and whirl in alarm. So... This is the cool thing about this is we have characters who have no idea what this thing is, but we have existed in this book in this world long enough to know that this pit is obelisk shaped um, and is described very much like an obelisk. So we can assume, even though we're told it specifically later, but at this point we can assume that either this is where the obelisks are created or this is where one hung out for a long time. But there's right. a lot of other mysteries going on here. Yeah. And like somehow the people who created this like modern civilization were the ones who Controlled this maybe for, mm-hmm. for, for a period of time at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like I like the notion that this is where the obelisks are made. Maybe. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. You know, we I don't think we can figure it out at this point. Benoff says that at the end of the book, but mm-hmm. um, we don't really get an understanding of how she knows, mm-hmm. other than she's spent her entire life studying them after this one moment. Um, and this is this is we didn't pull the slide on it because it's like right after this moment, but. This is the weirdest part in the book for me because this guardian takes the two of them away and then this guardian starts acting really funny and talking in a different voice um, that makes it seem like not it's like the the book makes it seem like very much it's not the guardian's voice. Someone else has inhabited the body of the guardian and is talking about can she hear it? Is it calling her? Um, It is very um, to me the, the, the what the, what we're supposed to take away from this is that a, a stone eater has like possessed the guardian possibly um and is talking through the guardian's body and then we see it executed after the fact after the other guardians come and see what's happened to this one and say pity and then just casually kill him or her i, I don't remember um but it, it's it, this is one of the parts that i didn't know a lot to do with it seems like it's very much set up for stuff that just hasn't paid off yet 
Yeah, um, I, it definitely seems like a stone eater, right? But I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. It's talking like a stone eater. It's 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 inhuman in um, its behavior, and it's just talking about the the nodules, the thing, the little iron spikes that pick. And if she touched one, which she didn't, um, something I mean, would happen. Yeah, something would happen. Yeah, yeah. But we don't know. This is one of those mysteries. This is like. I, I, I like reading series books, but this is one of those moments where I'm like, I just want to know things. <laughs> just, right. Yeah. This is one of those times where I'm like, uh, do I do I like the series enough to read the second book or do I just want to go look on Wikipedia and see what the answer is? Well, I mean, my answer to that question is definitely I like the series enough to read the second and book, second and yeah. third book. So. Yeah. I, 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 I don't seem to be reading many of the sequels to these books that we're reading. That is true. That is true. <laughs> All right. Next bit. Is soon joined by Hoa, a strange boy, and Tonki, a calmless woman, eventually arrives at a hidden underground calm called Kastrima, built into a huge geode. It's a geode. You can test that, the way the rock around you abruptly changes to something else. The pebble in the stream, the warp in the weft, countless eons ago, a bubble formed in a flow of molten mineral within Father Earth. Within that pocket, nurtured by incomprehensible pressures and bathed in water and fire, crystals grew. This one's the size of a city, which is probably why someone built a city in this one. (laughs) You stand before a vast, vaulted cavern that is full of glowing crystal shafts the size of tree trunks. Big tree trunks. Or buildings. Big buildings. They jut forth from the walls in an utterly haphazard jumble. Different lengths, different circumferences some white and translucent, and a few smoky or tinged with purple. Some are stubby, their pointed tips ending only a few feet away from the walls that grew them, but many stretch from one side of the vast cavern into the indistinct distance. They form struts and roads too steep to climb, going in directions that make no sense. It is as if someone found an architect, made her build a city out of the most beautiful materials available, then threw all those buildings into a box and jumbled them up for laughs. And they're definitely living in it. As you stare, you notice narrow rope bridges and wooden platforms everywhere. There are dangling lines strung with electric lanterns, ropes and pulleys carrying small lifts from one platform to another. In the distance, a man walks down a wooden stairway built around a titanic slanted column of white. Two children play on the ground far below and between stubby crystals the size of houses. Actually, some of the crystals are houses. They have holes cut in them, doors and windows. You can see people moving around inside of them. Smoke curls from chimneys, from chimney holes cut in pointed crystal tips. Evil eating earth, you whisper. We haven't talked about the the cussing slang in this book yet, and I think it's fantastic. Yeah, rusting and rusting and eating. It's like it's it's one of those, again, natural extensions of in a world where the the earth itself is constantly trying to kill you. What will your slang cuss words be grown out of? Yeah. Um, and I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I, I like I bought it. You know, it, it didn't. Yeah, it, it very rapidly stopped being weird to me. Yeah. And sometimes like uh, books like to do this a lot. They like to have their own slang and cuss words and stuff in them to make the world feel more real. And sometimes they're clunky and forced because it's just like, would people really ever adopt that? Um, but then sometimes they work really well. And I think this is one of those areas. Anyway, um, these people are living underground in a geode, which to any of our characters so far is like the craziest thing they've ever heard of. Because again, this is a a form of living that no one ever would do ever according to, um, stone lore. Like they just would never do it. Cause yeah, it's I mean, crazy, which immediately like whenever, whenever as soon is just like, this is the worst thing in the world. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm like, well, clearly there's something else going on. Like, yeah, like maybe like this thing is super reinforced in a way where, where the tectonic forces or, or seismic activity just like passes around it. Um, that, that's, that's kind of plausible to me actually. Yeah. Well, there's, um, there's a reginy there as well. That's true so. too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and they ha- the, the one there has a way to draw them to her as well, which is mm-hmm. a new power. I yeah. like that. Just like the the, the slow uh, incline or the the ramp down to them like it, yeah. through magic was really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, this is I think like one of the things we're doing is we're, we're challenging our characters perception of how the world works and how it should work and um, invent and showing new things like. We're going to get to in a sec, but right now with the the cyanite version of this character, she's on an island 
which no one knew people could survive on. So there's like two multiple instances of people living in ways in which no one had previously previously thought possible. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's a very intentionally designed type of thing to show that like the way that things have been done don't need to be the way that they're done. Yeah. Um, and that that echoes something with, that Alabaster says earlier in the story. I think that's just like surviving. The thing that allows you to survive doesn't make mean it's the right thing. Um, which yeah. I think is one of the big themes of the story. Yeah. We've seen this word cess a couple times now. Um, I just like this idea that it's, it's, it's a sense. It's, an, it's another sense that she doesn't really go like, it's just kind of one of those things where you learn what it is through how the characters use it. And yeah. It's, it's like something more than hearing. Certainly you can, you can sense vibration through objects and, and so mm-hmm. forth. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that, a writer probably has a tough time making calls like that, right? Because like you want you want to explain everything to your readers, but sometimes it doesn't make sense for characters to explain things like your senses. Like, can you imagine in a book taking time to explain the sense of smell right. to a reader? Like yeah. that just wouldn't make any sense. Why why are you doing that? Um so I, I like that 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 she trusts in our ability to to assess what this means just from the usage in the book. Mm-hmm. Do you see what, see what I did there? <laughs> I like that. I mean, I like that it already sounds like sus. Right. So, yeah. so you're like, yeah, it's kind of carries connotations. Yeah. I mean, she has, she has fun with words like orogeny or, or means mountain formation, but right. with a, it has a Y and not an E at yeah. the end. So there you go. Yep. Cool. All right. So here's the second of our two interludes of the story. This one's a lot more uh, ominous. <laughs> There passes a time of happiness in your life, which I will not describe to you. It is unimportant. Perhaps you think it's wrong that I dwell so much on the horrors, the pain, but pain is what shapes us after all. We are creatures born of heat and pressure and grinding, ceaseless movement. To be still is to be not alive. But what is important is that you know it was not all terrible. There was peace in long stretches between each crisis, a chance to cool and solidify before the grind resumed. Here is what you need to understand. In any war, there are factions, those wanting peace, those wanting more war for a myriad of reasons, and those whose desire transcends either. And then this war, and this is a war with many sides, not just two. Did you think it was just the stills and the erogenies? No, no. Remember the stone eaters and the guardians too. Oh, And the seasons, never forget Father Earth. He has not forgotten you. So while she, you, rested, those are the forces that gathered round, eventually beginning their advance. And so this is when the book basically, like we've already connected Cyanite with uh, Denia because Denia picked her, uh, picked her uh, orogeny name which was cyanide so we've, and this is i think the last piece of the puzzle like we're addressing the you this is the second person again to assume but we're talking about cyanide and her time on the island yeah, um and yeah. so this is when like the last bit of that and then now i think we understand finally that all of these three women are the same woman which we probably could have guessed after they link two of them together like it's like right probably not gonna be these two are linked but this is just some random chick over here but yeah um, this I mean, has got to yeah yeah, right. I mean, there's got to be some part of the book where she spells it out. So right, right. Um, and I again, I love the 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 word usage around the idea of rocks and cooling and like this, like that, that's that we're like this is again a rock eater talking, and it makes sense that they are describing function. They're describing life as grinding, as um, heat and pressure and ceaseless movement. And and again, we have this this very pointed line to be still is to be not alive. And that's very interesting in the fact that we call the non-powered, the non-orogenied people in this world stills. Um, it is called the stillness. That is the name of the land. And here's a person saying to be still is to be not alive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's that's very intentional. That's like defining um, what what the, the shape of this conflict is going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like I just like the word stills to refer to the people without the power. It's, mm-hmm. it's good good word 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 ability. Yeah. Um, word ability. Word word ability. Yeah. That right there is good word ability. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I don't have much to add here. I, 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 we're, we're setting up to, we're, we're priming you for something terrible to happen, basically. Yep. Um, to, to cyanide specifically. And it does. We kind of skipped over the fact that they got teleported to a happy island after she blew yeah. up that city. That was the thing I didn't quite know how to feel out, feel about. That was, that's like the literal definition of base X Machina. No, it's, um, it's not. No, it's, it's a stone eater X Machina. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's thing we've never heard of before. <laughs> whisking them away to another place. Okay. Whatever. The problem I have with it is, a, a bit later, we're going to see the Stone Eater save Alabaster again, uh-huh. but this time, it saves only him. Yeah. And so I don't understand why in this one, in this plot convenient moment, the Stone Eater grabbed both of them and moved them to the island. Um, but now it will only save Alabaster. It's not yeah. really explained. Yeah. Right. I don't know. All right. Um, so here, Cyanide and Alabaster have been living on Melv for almost two years. They've had a son, Corundum, and they're obeying the chief slash captain regularly. Nice. Yep. We have a decent life here. It's hard to hear him over the wind, and yet she can actually feel what he's not saying. Don't leave me. Crusty rust, bastard. What is wrong with you? I'm not planning to leave. Not now, anyway. But it's bad enough that they're having this conversation at all. She doesn't need to make it worse. I'm just going somewhere I can be useful. You're useful here. And now he turns to glare at her full on, and it actually bothers her, the hurt and loneliness that lurk beneath the veneer of anger on his face. It bothers her more than, it, than this bothers her. No, I'm not. And when he opens his mouth to protest, she runs over him. I'm not. You said it yourself. Mayov has a ten ringer now to protect it. I don't think I haven't noticed how we haven't had so much as a subsurface twitch in my range, not on all the time we've been here. You've been quelling any possible threat long before in and in, or I can feel it. But then she trails off, frowning, because Alabaster is shaking his head, and there's a smile on his lips that makes her abruptly uneasy. Not me, he says. What? I haven't quelled anything for about a year now. And then he nods toward the child, who's now examining Cyanite's fingers with intent concentration. She stares down at Koru, and Koru looks up at her and grins. Corundum is exactly what the Fulcran hoped when they paired her with Alabaster. He hasn't inherited much of Alabaster's looks, being only a shade browner than cyan and with hair that's only growing from fuzz into the beginnings of a proper ash blow bottle brush. She's the one with Sanzad ancestors, so that didn't come from Baster either. But what Koru does ha- but what Koru does have from his father is an almighty powerful awareness of the earth. It has never occurred to Cyanite before now that her baby might be aware enough to cess and still micro shakes. That's not instinct, that's skill. Oh, ominous, powerful baby child. Yep. It's the, it's the breeding. It's the Kwisatz Heterok. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. It's just one, this one, one book club where we don't talk about that book. I mean, I mean, everything is sourced from that book, Scott. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we, we've jumped ahead a little bit. And, and what I like about this is like Alabaster used to be the one that was all about like he wanted to be the one to change the world, right? Like this like but all he really wanted in the end was a place to live in peace and he's found it but that has never been enough for cyanide and she's just not content here we like that's it's very it's drawn for us very specifically here yeah um that she's not content with this she's she's searching for something else and and yes she's in this moment just like i just want to be useful i just want to go be a pirate and join the pirates and do piratey things but that's not going to be enough for her in the long run this is never the life that she wanted it's which is interesting because Asun has been keeping her head down for ten years. Like, yeah. the, the, I guess I guess the way this whole thing ends for her is so such a, like a slap down to this idea that she's gonna like adventure and and be a swashbuckling pirate and yeah and and exert her will in the world. She loses like everything, and so she's like, you know what, I'm I'm good just surviving. Mm-hmm. And I guess maybe the point is Alabaster is already at that point. Yeah, yeah, and. And the, the the most tragic part of this, of course, is that she's almost at that point right before they get attacked. <laughs> like yeah. she's the, the, the book is so mean when it make it, it like sets up this moment where the day the world ended was the most beautiful day they could remember. And they right. have just this beautiful picnic and everything's perfect. And then, of course, then it all comes crumbling down. Yeah. But, uh, and we also we, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's important that we establish Corundum as 
really powerful here. Um, like, yeah. like preternaturally, like super powerful. And yeah. um, it's not necessarily going to matter in the future because he dies. But um, I think it, it, it matters for like why it, it, an understanding of why they're so afraid of these people and why guardians will track them down no matter what. Mm hmm. Yeah, especially especially a, one of the strength of the wild, right? Yeah. 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 And then we're running out of time, so we're jumping way, way ahead. Sorry, everyone. But uh, now we're jumping right to the moment. Um, on the, so the the after years of living in safety, the Fulcrum and the Guardians have found Alabaster and Cyanite. Uh, Baster is saved by his Rock Eater friend again, but like we said before, Cyanite is left is left on the island to battle off the Guardians and save her son, and she uh. She she does not do that. <laughs> there are moments where when everything changes, you understand. Koru is wailing, terrified, and perhaps he even understands somehow what has happened to his father's. Cyanite cannot console him. No, she says again. No, no, no. Shafa's smile fades. Cyanite, I told you. Never say no to me. Even the hardest stone can fracture. It just takes the right force applied at the right juncture of angles. A fulcrum of pressure and weakness. Promise, Alabaster had said. Do whatever you have to, Inan had tried to say. And Cyanite says, No, you fucker. Koru is crying. She puts her hand over his mouth and nose to silence him, to comfort him. She will keep him safe. She will not let them take him, enslave him, turn his body into a tool and his mind into a weapon and his life into a travesty of freedom. You understand these moments, I think. Instinctively, it is our nature. We are born of such pressures, and sometimes when things are unbearable, Shafa stops. Cyanite. That's not my rusting name. I'll say no to you all I want, you bastard. She's screaming the word. Spittle froths her lips. There's a dark, heavy space inside her that is heavier than the stone eater, much heavier than a mountain, and it's eating everything else like a sinkhole. Everyone she loves is dead. Everyone except Koru. And if they take him... Sometimes even we crack. And then she destroys everything again. <laughs> yep, again. <laughs> uh, she, so sad. Yeah, she kills her son. Um, she kills... Uh, I, I, I don't know if we get confirm, confirmation whether or not Shafa is dead here. I don't... I, I feel like probably, but I don't, I don't... I feel like he's too important of a character to just be gone like that. Um yeah, I mean, I read it as I read it as him being dead, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him again yeah. because basically she she it says like there was only one body alive in the water. Yeah, it was um, hers. Which which I guess the the, the text could be misleading you, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, I mean, and the the part that we don't see after this is when like the text zooms out here. Like th this is kind of why I pulled this is because we're cutting back and forth between two perspectives now. Like we've we've combined Cyanide's story with Asun's story. Um, here and we're cutting back and forth between these two perspectives and and then we zoom out and this is this is right after this moment is when it is revealed that uh, hoa was the one um that was telling the story the entire time like mm -hmm. like uh, this is when you activated the obelisk to destroy this place that's when i found you and i i l latched onto you since then and i've been around you all all the time since from then until uh the present day in the story um yeah but for what reasons we don't know. Yep. We do learn that the stone eaters seem to be like fiercely territorial over the humans that they've kind of, um, claimed claimed. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is, which is an interesting, like, like opposite of the guardian, right? Like the, mm -hmm. each guardian has a, uh, orogeny and it seems like each of the stone eaters like claims an orogeny as well. Um, and I'm wondering what, what the story is going to explore with that, but that's not something that this book does. Yeah. I'm, I'm very curious. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's well set up. So in the chat, there there was stuff going on about Mistborn, but I, I think the reason why we haven't been responding to any of that is because <laughs> we haven't read it. Neither of us have read it, so we can't really say anything about that. Yeah. And Brendan says bye, and we missed that. Have a good night, Brendan. Yeah, yeah. See you next time. Yeah. Um, all right, this is the last slide, Scott. The final pages of the book. Yeah, Alabaster, turns out, is in Kastrima, the geode city, and he's asking for a soon. You don't want to understand, but now your eyes are drawn away from the horror that remains of your mentor, your lover, your friend, to the side and behind Alabaster, where a strange object rests against the wall of the infirmary. It looks like a glass knife, but the blade is much too long and wide for practical use. 
It has an enormous handle, perhaps because the blade is so stupidly long, and a cross piece that will get in the way the first time someone tries to use the thing to cut meat or slice through a knot. And it's not made of glass, or at least not any glass you've ever seen. It's pink, verging on red, and and you stare at it, into it. You feel it trying to draw your mind in, down, falling, falling up through an endless shaft of flickering, faceted pink light. You gasp and twitch back into yourself defensively, then stare at Alabaster. He smiles again, painfully. The spinel, spinel, is that it? I don't know how to say that. The spinel, he says, confirming your shock. That one's mine. Have you made any of them yours yet? Do the obelisks come when you call? You don't want to understand, but you do. You don't want to believe, but really, you have it. You have all along. You tore that rift up north, you breathe. Your hands are clenching into fists. You split the continent. You started this season. With the obelisks, you did all of that. Yes, with the obelisks and with the help uh, and with the aid of the node maintainers. They're all at peace now. He exhales wheezily. I need your help. You shake your head automatically, but not in refusal. To fix it? Oh, no, Cyan. You don't even bother to correct him this time. You can't take your eyes from his amused, nearly skeletal face. When he speaks, you notice that some of his teeth have been turned to stone, too. How many of his organs have done the same? How much longer can he, should he, live like this? I don't want you to fix it, Alabaster says. I want, uh, it was collateral damage, but Eumenes got what it deserved. No, what I want you to do, my Demaya, my Cyanite, my Esun, is to make it worse. Tell me, he says, have you ever heard of something called a moon? <gasps> dun, dun, dun. So th- this is the end of the book. Um, and this is, this is the thing that frustrates me about this book. And this is why we didn't pull as much from the end. Because this is all like interesting in the way of like, I don't have anything to say about it because none of it really makes sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like there's a, there's a power that the obelisks has that she can tap into and has in the past, but not to the level he has. There's like a sword thingy that is, I guess, like a piece of an obelisk that he's yeah. using because like the, the wording around this, like the 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 falling up thing is a is very pointed language that's used every time power and the obelisks are used. Right. Yeah. Like it's it's opposite of the down into the earth. It's up to the obelisk. So I think that is that is meant to draw that connection specifically. Yeah. Um, but we don't know anything about this. <laughs> like we don't we don't know what's happening to Alabaster. We know he used power and it's like half stone now um and is dying we know we get confirmation that he's the one responsible for this and he wants to make it worse um we know it's going to involve the moon somehow i'm I'm pretty sure what we talked about the the moon being the secret reason why all this started is going to be revealed later but like this is the end of the book and and, like i don't the the only the the sentence i really like in this is is my demaya my cyanite my assume um because that is the book kind of drawing all three of those stories together in one final moment before the story ends um but we don't get conclusion (laughs) like we don't like it's just kind of this i mean this is what happens when you have a trilogy of books right yeah Yeah. and i kind of wish there was a way where we could tell one complete story while also still telling a, a ongoing story and i don't think we get that here and that's that bums me out yeah i mean and i guess you could say you get the story of of alabaster like he Sure. He, sure, he sacrifices fair. his life for something he believes is going to right the wrongs, even though it's going to cost a huge amount of destruction. Um, he he got to put the node maintainers to rest, which I guess is something that he thinks is important. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I don't disagree with you. It's definitely it's, it definitely doesn't leave me very satisfied. And um, you're just like, well, okay, I guess I. I need to read the next one to figure yeah, out what, what that means. Yeah, I go on to the next one, yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. I mean, is not necessarily a bad thing because you've just sold the next book, but I don't know. I just, I I want, I wanted it now. <laughs> yeah. I want it now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like, I like just this, the ending where the way she realizes that he did it and she doesn't react like, oh God, he's a monster. She just kind of is like, 
yeah, that sounds about right. Like, right. And, and like she says, you shake your head automatically, but not in refusal. Right. Like, like you're still like, kind of on board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, you're still going to help him because it's, it's alabaster. Yeah. Yeah. And five, six, seven says, and we still don't know what happened to her daughter, which is absolutely right. The, the kind of the instigating inciting event of the story, the thing that carried as soon our main character through the present day form of the story is left completely unresolved. Yeah. We um, haven't found the husband haven't found the daughter we don't even know where they are like we know they're not here um and there's there's so much left over like we don't understand who hoa is what hoa has said the um the the kastrima is not safe for them um but we haven't learned why Mm -hmm. um there's just all kinds of mysteries around here there's just a bunch of unknowns it's okay to have unknowns in a continuing story i think that's fine i don't want to do that but i wish i wish some of these things got concluded for us um but yeah. i think you're right alabaster got a, a conclusion mm-hmm. but he's not the protagonist no so now that we're at the end of the story there's one thing that i wanted to talk about we talked about this before just like are we supposed to ask okay so cyanite murders her own son to protect him from a life of torture and and being abused and being used yes and then, and then later, her husband kills their son for reasons which, from his point of view, seem very similar. Asun obviously never thinks of it in these terms. Mm-hmm. She never, she never compares her killing her own son to her husband killing his own son. Um, but like the the even the reasons why they do it align very much. Like if you've been taught your whole life to think that an erogeny is, is a monster who can expect nothing more than, you know, being treated as a monster and killed, like from his point of view, it's a mercy ki- kill just, just as she was mercy killing her son. But I'm like, I don't know if the book wants me to be asking that or not. Like, it seems like such an obvious parallel, but, but what it says about, what it says about Asun is that her quest for revenge against her husband is, is, I don't know, hypocritical. Yeah, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say hypocritical. I mean, I do, I do agree that um, she's like I, I, I do agree that we're supposed to draw a line between these two killings. I don't fully agree that um, his murder of his son is supposed to be seen as for the same reasons that her murder of her son was. Um, yeah, I mean, but- his his was primarily motivated by fear of him. Where hers was primarily primarily motivated by fear for him, and I think that's a very big distinction. Well, we don't actually know. <laughs> we don't. Well, know. I mean, and I think well, that's... we don't. But I, we there's we there's nothing that's led us to believe that like he. But of course, that's the mystery because why would he still have the daughter with him, right? Well, why would she right. still be alive? Uh, oh, and... oh, I'm I'm certain that this won't end up just being like, yeah, he's he's just a, a horrible dude who killed his son because he's a horrible dude. Like, yeah. it, it's gonna be some horrible, shocking thing that turns her world upside down when she finally catches him because, because yeah. uh, like, yeah, I, I I I don't think you can murder your child out of fear of them. I think <laughs> I don't think that works. I think you would just be like, well, I guess you kill me now. Because it's better, better you than me, right? Like, like the you the reason you have a very optimistic viewpoint of people. Well, well, that's the thing. Either he's a monster, in which case that's kind of boring, but fine. Yeah. Or he's a, a reflection of her, and he's gonna, and I, I suppose in the future, gonna force her to 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 to, to recognize that. I, I certainly agree with that. Um, I I agree that that the book wants you to think about those things. And I think these are things we're going to return to. I, I I will agree that I don't think the book makes it clear that it wants you to connect those things. I think that's very, very subtextual. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it wants to like, I mean, the death of children is a recurring event in this story. Right. Um, it happens many times, I think three, right. In the, in this at least. Um, and then it's talked about tangentially that other people have gone through it. But, um, through our characters, we see, Two of Asun's children die. We see Alabaster's son die uh, in that node. And presumably, who knows how many of the nodes that he tapped into were his children. Probably a mm-hmm. lot of them. So yeah, the 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 killing of your the infanticide. Um, of your own children. Yeah, of your own less. children um, is a common connecting factor in this. And and yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know if the book has really gotten to the main idea of what it's what it's exploring with that concept. 
Um, but I definitely think it wants you to be thinking of it. And, and, and thusly, it wants you to be drawing a line between each and every one of them. Well, here's, here's the thing is I, I can connect this to the other thing we were talking about, this idea that she just like leaves devastation in her wake and kills so many people wherever she goes. It, it's kind of this idea that like um, the, the world is so, is so bad and people are so bad that it's just to just wipe them out. Like it's better for them to be dead. Yeah. But it's, it's better for everyone in this town to be dead. It's better for my children to be dead than to live in this world. And like, man, is that a dark sentiment? And I don't know if if I'm if I'm like missing something, or is that the whole sentiment? You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think I mean, I think the the sentiment is that that is fundamentally broken. That that yeah. that that is true, but it is fundamentally broken, and and our characters are working to fix that. Um, but yeah. but it is true in the moment. Yes. Um, I mean that that's the thing we we talked about her destruction of the town of of Tiramo, the town she lived in. Um, but we didn't mention the fact that the only reason that town is still standing is because she protected it accidentally. Mm-hmm. She didn't she didn't want to protect the town from the the wave uh, after the destruction in the beginning of the season, but she did it to protect her son's corpse. And it just so happened to keep the town alive. Yeah. Um, so and that the, the, the worst season ever was going to be coming on and everyone is probably going to die anyway, True. because they're, they're estimating that the season's going to last hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly this is a this is a society and is a, is a way of life that is fundamentally broken um fun, like terrible extreme in every kind of way and it, it is the type of thing that brings out the worst in humanity and that's what we're seeing all across the board yeah and yeah, yeah like five six seven says the condemnation of a society that pushes people to these extremes that's just, that's yeah, absolutely right th- that's right but that, that that's just even that just kind of like asks even more questions in my mind because then you're saying like well i mean if you put humans in a bad enough situation is it the fact that they live on a hell planet or is it their society that you blame? And, and, and for that matter, how do you blame a society that I don't know if that's a coherent statement? Like it's I, I'm I'm not complaining, actually. I think I it's fascinating. It's asking some really interesting questions. I, I almost wish that I, I guess I'm going to have to read the next book to find out, like, <laughs> like what what is where does she go with these themes? Does yeah. she? Does she leave them as questions? Because that's fine. I, I like a book that it makes me ask questions, but I also wonder if she provides answers at some point. Yeah. Um, I don't know if blame is the right word. I don't, I don't think the point of the book is to blame the society, um, but I think it's to examine and, uh, I mean, condemn seems a, like a different word than blame for me. Mm-hmm. But um, but I, I do think that the, one of the whole, one of the whole, the central points of the book is this idea that we have to do it this way because this is the only way we can survive. And I think the book is rejecting that idea. I think the book is saying that's not necessarily true. There mm-hmm. are other ways. And I mean, that's if we, if we connect this back to the, to our slavery discussion, our slavery metaphor, that is an argument that was made. We have to keep these people sl- enslaved because, or else our way of life will be ruined. It will not work any other way. This is the only way it will work. Mm-hmm. Um, and that of course was fundamentally false it was not a true statement there are other there are definitely other ways to live and to survive in in the world without this system mm-hmm. and i think that's one of the things the book is going to to show and and i, yeah. I i'm interested in seeing like obviously alabaster's method of of proving that point is to completely wipe out um almost everything we do get it we do get at the very beginning of this book we get the idea that you will survive you being humankind that plural Mm -hmm. you again people will survive this event even if it works exactly as alabaster is planning it humanity will not be wiped out but certainly most of it will and is is the book going to say that is the necessary and good thing to do to fix this broken system to to usher in a new way of doing things or is his has has his way been lost in in anger and um and desperation and the real way is better i don't know i don't know yeah a lot of very interesting questions with great metaphorical implications to our world and how we live our lives i mean yeah it's a great it's a great book on the thematic level makes you think a lot so yeah yeah i mean that's 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 why i love doing this book club because i I enjoy the book on the surface level when i read it and then i enjoy it on a whole different level when we get to sit down and, and ponder it yeah 
All right, Matt, let's, uh, let's talk about next month. Yeah. Next month. This is probably one of the, uh, the closest votes we've ever had. Um, we decided we had been speaking of doing the sequels of books, Matt. Um, we decided that we had been talking about this idea of we should come back and visit, um, some of the books we've, the sequels to some of the books we've done. So we decided to have a full month of, um, five different options of sequels to books we've covered in the book club. And the winner that we're covering in March is Red Seas Under Red Skies, which is the sequel to Scott Lynch's The Lies of Locke Lamora, um, which is, I think, a book we read almost exactly a year ago, actually. Cool. Um, and it's a book I really enjoyed, so I'm looking forward to diving into this one. Um, I think things are going to, judging by the cover of this book, Matt, things are going to get <laughs> a little rough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with this pick. I think this might have been the only, the only sequel of a series that we, um, uh, the only sequel to a book that we had read that I haven't read on my own accord, but I still want to. So yeah, perfect. It, perfect. it was a very close vote. I think it won by one vote um, against um, foundation. Uh, foundation and empire, the mm-hmm. sequel to foundation, um, which is a book we didn't enjoy, but I, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be reading the sequel to that no matter what, um, yeah. because it's part of my, the thousand books I need to read before I die, which that project is not going well, by the way, so <laughs> slow going. I've read three of them. I need to live for a very long time. Yeah. Anyway, well, that sounds like that sounds like a good a good trick. Yeah. Anyway, we will be we will be reading Red Seas Under Red Skies, um, and we will be meeting Friday, March 29th at 9:30 p.m. Um, we are back in actually meeting on the last Friday of the month. We finally, after three months, caught back up to that. Um, so it'll be four weeks from tonight, I believe. So you have four weeks to read the book. Um, if you haven't read The Lies of Locke Lamore, but you want to participate. Go do that. It's a really good book, too. And you can listen to our book club from last year about that, too, in preparation for this one, if you want to do that, too. Um, that's a lot. It's a lot in one month, but you can do it. Yeah. You can do yeah. it. Join us. Yeah. And if you have any questions or comments or anything about uh, Red Seas, Skies Under Red Seas Under Red Skies, oh, that's going to be a handful name, or uh, the fifth season or anything we talked about tonight, you can reach out to us at doofmedia at gmail.com or over on our Twitter account at doofmedia. And uh, yeah. Kirk McDonald in the chat before we go asked if we ever read Wise Men's Fear. We both have, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am um, working on a show around the King Killer Chronicles because I liked it so much, but I'm not ready to announce anything yet because I got a lot of work to do and it's been a busy yeah. month. But uh, we'll, we will be announcing something around that hopefully fairly soon. I am looking forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So if you like what we do here at Doof Media and you want to see more of it, head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash doofmedia, and consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. You'll get access to our private Discord server as well as the ability to vote for which books we cover and tons of other cool benefits. Go check it out. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, all of you that turned it, turned out live for this. Um, I had a lot of fun talking to you guys. It is always more fun when we have more people here. So if you're listening to this recorded after the day consider coming to hang out on on friday night next time it is really i I enjoy it a lot i think the people that come out and chat with us enjoy it as well so do that and um i guess we'll see you all next month scott lynch another series that's never gonna end matt (laughs) keep doing this Uh, we can't keep doing this (sighs) shrimp shrimp heaven now Now. Uh, i'll never get tired of that never Ooh, it was fun. Yeah. I ran out Thanks of water everyone. an hour ago. It was so we, thirsty. Yep. I'm I'm so tired, everyone. <laughs> yeah, Matt was uh, feeling yeah. sick and recovered miraculously right before the book club. Yeah. So thanks for being a trooper tonight, Matt. Oh, sure. I uh, would never miss it. <laughs> I suppose I suppose it's possible that I could miss it if I were just extremely sick. But that would um, be a lot of uh, that would be a lot of pressure on me. I'm yeah. leading the whole book club. Yeah. No, I mean we'd probably just we'd probably we'd just pro- we'd it, right? it, we'd move it. Yeah. 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 Although I mean I I want to try to do solo stuff. That's what I'm working on with the other stuff. So it would yeah, be good. It would be good uh, forced practice. Sure, but you wouldn't have to do that live. So. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks five six seven and Kirk. Thanks for hanging out. Um, I really. I, I, I'm going to read them. Um, I have another book series I'm finishing up, uh, the passage series. I need to read the third book of that. And then I need to read another Stephen King book, um, on my list of 
rereading all the Stephen King books and then I'm jumping back into Broken Earth and finishing these two books because I really, really want to continue happening it. Oh yeah, and also I have to read Red Seas Under Red Skies. That's why I have a, a big old giant stack of to-be-read books behind me over there. That I'm, oh, it's, so, never, it's never going sorry. down. Sorry, I just realized all three books are out. I, I thought I for some reason thought the last book wasn't out and I was like, oh, this is another one of those. No, no, this is this is one of those that's done. Jemison writes a... Uh, Writes completes her series. I think she has three trilogies out actually, and they're all done. Okay, but yeah, this one every single one of these books is one of Hugo, which is kind of crazy. That is pretty crazy, actually. All right. I mean, all one right. one or two I could see, but all three of them, that's pretty nuts. Yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. Yeah, if you haven't read Liza Lacomora Five Six Seven, I. It's a fu- it's a fun book. It's just a fun book. Yeah. I really had a lot of fun with that one. <laughs> I mean, I remember our episode about it, and we yeah. we, we just I just remember just like s- smiling, you know. Yeah, we I think we laughed a lot too. She yeah. published this series in three years. Dang, guys. Yeah. Every she needs to she needs to teach Patrick Patrick Rothfuss her ways. Yeah, I know his but books he... are considerably longer. Yeah. But... Well, we we know of a lot of writers who can write a lot faster than yeah than Rothfuss. <laughs> Uh, why did I keep getting thrown into these damn George R. R. Martin, Patrick Rothfuss, Scott Lynch? It's just... Yeah, I think there's a pattern. I think it's like the if if an author is good enough to create really good books, then they're also really meticulous and perfectionist, which means that they're going to take freaking forever. That's true. That's true. And the more popular they become, the more pressure it is. And mm-hmm. the interesting thing about Scott Lynch is he's like. His series, he knows his series is going to be seven books and he has all the titles already. They're just slow to come out. Yeah. Which is surprising. Yeah. Um, I think there's supposed to be the fourth one comes out this year, I think. Okay. But apparently Good. that's been said before. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I didn't know. I didn't know the the fifth season was this. Was that new? 2016. I thought it was a little older than that. For some reason. So four. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's still. I, for some reason, I thought this was the first series she wrote, and I guess it isn't. I guess the Inheritance trilogy uh, that she wrote exists before that. But <clears throat> all right, guys, we're probably gonna pack it in so Matt can go to bed. I'm wide awake because I drank a <laughs> cup of coffee before I started, <laughs> but I'll just read something else. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Right. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out as always, guys. It is it's always a great time. We love doing this, and. Uh, I closed the thing that I needed open to shut the stream down, so I'm going to have to go find that again. (laughs) We will catch you next month. It's not yet, Matt. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Live events. Mm -hmm. Live control room. (laughs) And stop streaming. (laughs) Night, guys.